Welcome everybody to week three of uh, Art 1.1. And uh, I hope everyone has now printed out, you should have uh, with you for the first, uh, oh, I don't know, 40 minutes or so. It'll take probably to go over how to write your papers. So you can actually, by the end of this class, have a solid idea, an actual image, and I do mean literally an image, I will show it to you on the screen, but I already sent it to you too as a sample paper from a previous student uh, who got uh, A's on, on their papers. And uh, you should have that available. You don't necessarily have to print that out. It's, I think it's five pages or maybe six, including the illustration, which was uh, the basic normal length or average length of um, <clears throat> someone's in the waiting room, hang on, uh, of what an A paper should be, uh, three to five pages. That's all you need to do. So we're gonna go over that in a few minutes, how to write the paper with, if you didn't already have them out, please put next to your laptop or computer. <clears throat> the five requirements handouts, one page for short papers. We'll go over that and then I will discuss uh, while holding up each page on the computer screen for you to look at or take a screenshot if you prefer of the sample paper, but you already I already sent it to everybody who was enrolled. Now I've had a couple new students add. We've actually gone up, it's unusual this late, by about three students. So if those new students are here tonight, I'm gonna to go ahead and tell you, I didn't have time to send everybody who's enrolled in the last few days uh, the handouts from the first two classes. So you just need to email me. This is true for everybody, every class. If you're missing any handout after about the fifth week though, there won't be any new handouts, but there will be a couple more. And whenever you just don't have one uh, for whatever reason, just email me please at the Mark W though, not the, because the, for some reason, the Outlook uh, website doesn't let me uh, do attachments from my computer. So I can only send them to you through my AOL, Mark W at AOL account. Okay, gonna admit a couple more people there. Excuse me, I have a question. Sure, please. <clears throat> um, I got an email yesterday about a meeting around oh, this time. Yeah. Did yeah, I miss sure. anything? I was just giving everyone the opportunity. I sent an email about it, but I know people don't always, Every I send a lot of emails. I'll go ahead and tell you all that. So it's a good question. Yeah, and very helpful to clarify. I was about to get to it. So you just beat me to the punch. Yeah, it was just oh, nice to a makeup session in case anyone missed the first half of last week, which was the nine elements. Very important. Guess what? It didn't record. It started to and it just stopped. You know, hey, what can we, you know, just tonight, you guys might have noticed how late my invitation, my login info came to you. It wasn't about me. I spent 10 minutes trying to get through the stupid maze of differing access, you know, routes to get onto my faculty portal. I almost went out to my studio, which isn't even in my house, and, and did it that way, which happened the first night of class, if you recall. So, you know, one of those things is my wife and daughter, both more tech savvy than I am, explain things can go wrong, you know, when you're even using the same process through the same platform any given two different times. So I will, uh, from now on, to avoid a delay, and some of you may wonder, is there class tonight or what's going on, for the reason you ask, as well as just being delayed. If that happens in the future, okay, um, I, I think the best thing for you to do is, uh, is two things. One is wait at least till say 7.05, but it shouldn't take that long. I, I'm gonna start logging you. I mean, sending, sorry, I meant sending the login information about 20 minutes before class. So if it takes an extra five minutes to get through the maze of the you know internet to get that to you, they should still be by 6.20, 10 minutes before class, you should be able to start looking. But don't give up right away. So not many people have, but a few seem to. The other thing is, if you did miss, some people did, the first part of last week's lecture on the nine elements, please now go see the first half. If you didn't log in, a few people did from this section to my uh, 1.2, which is a Tuesday night class, because it's exactly the same. 
Exactly. The nine elements apply to any class in art history that I teach. Same requirements, same information, same explanations, same uh, half lecture, the first half. So that's already now going to be posted or will, I said, sorry, will be posted if you missed it last night and you missed it last week, which hopefully it doesn't apply to many. You can find that, you know, you don't need to watch the first hour and 15 minutes or so, hour and 20 minutes. The first half of the, of the lecture, I already sent an email, so I'm not going to send another one, will be posted as are all uh, videos from each Zoom class every week by the Friday of that week uh, at, by 7 p.m. And so you could always watch it either to refresh your memory or before you write your papers or if you just missed it. Okay, that's why you got the extra invitation. All right, let's move on to a couple of other announcements um, before we get started on discussing how to write your papers. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to read the names of the few people I still didn't get many bios from. I'm supposed to uh, do a no-show drop. It's called a census report. Uh, faculty is supposed to do by the end of this week. And I'm gonna wait till around uh, 5 p.m. on Friday to do that. Oh, someone else wants to get in, I think. No, looks like, okay, we got everyone so far. Uh, so there aren't many. So if, if you hear your name, that means there's only like five or six. I still didn't get a mini bio from you and that would mean you need to send it uh, hopefully by tomorrow. Certainly no later than, than uh, midday fr Friday, like three o'clock or so. So I have time to log, log it in and count you as enrolled in the class. And then I'm not going to take roll or do anything else after this week. Okay, so Jessica Buccio Gariado, I hope I said that right, didn't get one from these people. Manu Kaur, Gray Lenovich, I think I said that right, Michael Pitkovich, and Kevin Solis, I believe that's it. So that's a pretty good, oh no, sorry. Oh. Os Osmani Williams, I also didn't get. Uh, so, sorry, who? Who, who am I? Can't see yeah, you. Michael here. I actually sent mine. I saw your name, that's but weird. it didn't go through for some reason. Could you resend it? Thank you. See, that's why I'm doing this. Yeah. Email. To AOL, please. Right. If you send it to the other one, sometimes I can't open those. Or if you didn't send yeah. it as a PDF, remember as a PDF. It's a, Got it. I got to go ahead and mark you down as being in class. So don't worry, I'm not going to drop you. But yeah, it's good to have me read your mini bio like everyone else. You know, so I know your background a little bit. So just send that to Mark W at AOL uh, as a PDF as soon as you get a moment. Not not now, but later tonight or tomorrow, okay? Then you're all set. Looks like we have at least a couple more people wanting to join. Um, okay, so that's one announcement. Did that, done that. Then uh, the next one is about the uh, extra credit option that I really am excited for. I've already had some students for my Tuesday night class. I guess they stayed up late because we ran past 930, which we won't do tonight. We should end a little early. Most nights went about 10 minutes early, but not every night. Anyway, the point is somehow between then and midnight last night, already a couple students have gotten extra credit for having a very enjoyable experience. And here it is. It's an option for all of you. It's a new one. Not a new option. I meant a new um uh, video option within the movie watching or documentary watching uh you know uh choice you can make here we go it's i saw this on netflix on friday the day it came out it was advertised or reviewed i should say reviewed in the san francisco chronicle with rave reviews and and they they weren't exaggerating it's a really interesting film about an hour and 40 minutes called the two words the dig you might think, huh, what's that? You might be able to guess. It's about archaeology. Yes and no. It's about uh, romance, World War II, about to start. It's a true story, in other words. And we're going to cover the, the topic that they were uh, exploring, or, or, or sorry, say ex excavating the site. And uh, when we get after the midterm to medieval art, um, we, will, we will actually see some of the objects from this dig. It's a world famous experience where an amateur, an older retired amateur who taught himself how to be uh, an archeological uh, excavator found one of the most valuable troves of um, early medieval art ever found in anywhere in the world, or certainly of European art at least. It was in England and it was right like a month before, or maybe what about that, before World War II started. So things were a little tense you know, with the Hitler in Europe. And, 
and uh, that has some impact. And also there's a really very charming romance between two of the assistants that eventually are assigned and someone tries to take his credit away from him because the British Museum comes, hears about it and tries to take it over. But he has a sponsor, the woman who owns the land is all a true story on which the find was. She defends him and insists he gets credit. I'm not gonna give away, there's all kinds of conflicts. It's, it's not just about the archeological digging and the find, it's about human conflicts and interesting uh, interactions between very interesting characters. And if you, some of you know, Ralph Fiennes, one of the best British actors of the last generation, he plays the main role of the true historic person who found this. He just had a hunch and he knew where to look and he almost dies. I mean, it's not boring, I guarantee you. Okay, so that's on Netflix, The Dig. You watch it, write two pages summarizing what you learned about that, you know, uh, event and, and the people in it and you get 10 points. Okay, so that option will be there, of course, all semester. All right. <clears throat> now, um, we also, uh, oh, I also need to remind people, I'm getting a few mini bios and I've sent replies whenever I have time, but sometimes I get a whole bunch all at once and I don't always get back to people. If I can't open it, it's because you didn't send it as a PDF and if I can't read it, uh, I don't always have a chance to reply and say, please resend this. So. Um, at this point, I don't think there's a problem. If your name wasn't on the list I just read out of six people that I didn't yet get many bios from, don't worry, you're all set. But if it was on that list, uh, or if you know that you sent your mini bio as a uh, JPEG or some other format, please resend it to my AOL, Mark W at AOL.com. Uh, if we sent it just as like the body of um yeah that's okay too i meant to say that thank you okay yeah like that's fine sure like just a text yeah that'll work no problem okay i'm going to go to a uh, speaker view because i've got some things to show you on the screen here we go um all right so let's see i think we're going to want the full screen here so let's see what we have gallery view yeah hmm Usually there's a place to, you know, hide the thumbnails, but whatever, we'll just deal with that later if need be. All right, so now let us shift gears to go over how to write your, your papers. Five requirements. And so I, I'm not going to um, hold this up for a long time because you should all have it, but just so you know which handout we're gonna be spending the next, oh, I don't know, 20 minutes or more going over that's the one you should have in front of you there. And if you don't, I'll hold it up for about another 30 seconds. You can take a screenshot. And of course, don't forget, if you didn't get it yet, email me and I'll send it to you as a separate attachment. Okay. You should have this with you when you work on your papers. I suggest, You don't have to. But this is uh, what helps people uh, make sure they don't forget something. Okay. Um, let's do the five requirements one by one. And any question at any point, that pops up in your mind, please uh, don't hesitate to ask. Okay, first, uh, you must have at least one full page each, and I put this in caps on both the meaning and the formal analysis. Please keep these two sections separate and label them. That makes, uh, makes it certain that we won't confuse me or the readers when we're grading your papers, you know, what section you're writing about what part of the two aspects of analysis that is required in this class, both on both of the two papers and on the two exams. When you're analyzing some slides during the midterm and final, you have to use the same approach. Please label them and keep them separate. Now, I covered the nine elements last week, and by now almost all of you should have seen that. Again, you, if you just joined, a couple people just joined us in the last few minutes, that's uh, going to be posted uh, by uh, 7 p.m on Friday, but it's actually the ART 1.2 lecture because 1.1 didn't record that part or it started to and then just stopped. So um, the lucky break that we have for those of you who might still have not seen that part of, it's the first like hour and 15 minutes of both classes is you could just go look at it from the ART 1.2, it's the same lecture. Okay, uh, so what do we mean when we say one full page? Well, uh, that's defined in number two requirement. So let us 
you know, segue and see how they two tie in with each other. Number two, papers must be a minimum of two full pages in length, uh, which means a maximum of um, se seven pages. Please don't give me more. But each page, a full page is defined as this, a double spaced 12 point typeface with 23 lines on each page. And that's an easy way. We don't do word counts. It slows you down and, you know, there's, you know, some, uh, uh, you know, nebulousness to that. But there, there isn't. The word counts. A word of text is as obvious when you see it. So if your papers are submitted in either par part of either half, either the meaning or the formal analysis or both, are less than 23 lines, it's pretty reasonable, right? A minimum of one page for college research paper in each half. You could have one half be one page and the, and the other, you know, maybe the meaning is, is three pages and the formal analysis is one. It's unlikely, it's more likely to spend more time on the formal analysis because there are nine elements to write about. But anyway, it doesn't matter what, you know, balance there is. But if either section is less than 23 lines, you get a couple points off on that, you know, portion of the paper. And if you did on both por portions, you'd probably drop yourself a whole grade before you can start grading it. So you don't want to do that to yourself. It's not that difficult to just double check that you gave me or you know submitted at least 23 full lines, double space, 12 point typeface, okay? Um, all right, I think those two, the first two, which of course correlate with each other is pretty self-explanatory. Any questions about the length requirements? I will tell you this, it's a common, common thing. I know I tried to do it a few times at Berkeley, easy and it didn't work. Um, if, if you start a page two or three or four lines down, you know, or like you, you, you lower the title and then you make double, double extra space between that and the first line, that's not gonna fool <laughs> me or the readers. We'll be able to see if it's not the full length. So, so try to just conscientiously follow that minimal requirement. Okay. Do you have any preference or do you mind what the font type is? Isn't it Times New Roman is the most easily readable? At least it's what 95% of all the papers submitted are. Yeah, if you get two, you know, like Old English or, you know, some guy, I don't know, is it more one Gothic typeface? It's best Times New Roman is that's pretty much the accepted in every college that I, you know, I've taught at 12 colleges and I've never heard of anybody say there's a different one required. So probably stick with that. It's easiest. How many to, lines for, uh, did you say? I, m I missed what you were saying. Well, How it's many lines? Number, on the handout number two, 23 lines. 23. Okay. Yeah. For each section. You know, in order to get an A, you're probably going to go a little longer than that, like, you know, maybe a page and a half. So you might have like, you know, 35 lines, and then you know you're covered. In terms of the length, you actually will get graded. Uh, and we're going to go over that after we finish with this handout of five requirements, uh, how you get graded in detail. Okay. But, but I'm just telling you up front. If you do that to either one or both sections, you just dropped a few points. And if you did it on both sections, you probably down a whole letter grade uh, from the start of, before we grade the uh, context of your paper, the content, I meant. Okay, number three, illustrations. This should be easy, especially with this format of digitally submitting things. But there are occasionally people who submit some thumbnail thing from an, a, a website, you know. Uh, you know, barely bigger than a large postage stamp. Uh, that that will get you a lot of points off because either I or the readers, when we're re reading your paper, we need to be able to see the clear detailing of each of the elements that you write about in the image. So here we go. Number three, illustrations must be at least four by six inches. In other words, half a page, the equivalent of half page of whatever format you're using on your digital file and in color unless the original work was in black and white. And yes, there is a student, I don't call names out here, but you know, you identified yourself, I think the first week, uh, who doesn't have full normal color vision. That person should remind, I'll grade those papers, remind me of that. But I actually wrote that person's name down and I'm not gonna call it out, but the point is there are rare exceptions where if there is some actual disability, that's not very common. I'd say about once a year, something like that will come up. But the other exception that's more common is you're writing about a black and white work of art, you know, black and white photo or um, some kind of abstract painting where um, there, there only are, you know, black and white images or an engraving, 
uh, any engraving is pretty much, well, there are exceptions, but usually line engravings, you know, from the Renaissance all the way through M.C. Escher in the late 20th century, th there's no color there. So you just need to say that. If that's the case with the work of art and you don't want us to inadvertently drop points off for you uh, on the uh, requirement for, for number three for illustrations, then you need to state it in that section of the paper where you're discussing color. Or, or even below the the illustration itself, if if you prefer. Okay, that's that doesn't I don't think right bear a lot of discussion. Okay, but now the the four and five are where people miss more points than anything else on their first papers if they don't follow these detailed um, requirements. Bibliographies must contain at least three new sources. So you can use Stockstead and Gill. And if you follow this and meet the requirements, you can have five sources total in your bibliography. But when you write your bibliography, at least one of those new sources must be printed. Well, you know what? I've had to modify that. Where I get, you know, and I was already doing that before the shutdown and the distance learning that we're all <clears throat> engaged in. So it should have been originally a print source, at least one of them. It can be the online inver uh, version, sorry, I guess, of Encyclopedia Britannica. In other words, don't just use websites. At least give me something else. And so I've actually um, been pretty flexible about that. Original print source or from print source or uh, digital whatever online version of whatever it is. And then it'll be easy for me to tell if the original was, but you should state that if, you, if you're doing that. Uh, so this this requirement I've gotten a little bit more uh, lax about only because it's so hard to double check if it's a source I've never heard of. But in other words, don't just use one or two websites. But Wikipedia is okay. By the way, my daughter says that at her high school, the, most of the teachers won't let them use Wikipedia at all. I don't understand that. That doesn't make a lot of sense. It didn't used to be a very reliable website. They, they were sued over False information, I'll give you an example in a few minutes, but uh, now they're about as reliable as any other informational website because they have to have sources for each one of the articles stated clearly at the bottom of the article. You all know that if you use Wikipedia. You can use Wikipedia. It can even be two of your sources. Don't make it for all three or you get points off uh, or any one website. Uh, so hopefully you'll, you'll broaden. Now, what other sources could you use for bibliographies? Um, Okay, you could use lecture notes from this class or any other class that relates to the subject of the artwork you're writing. Uh, you can use interviews with the artist or their website. These days, almost every artist has their own website uh, or websites about an artist if they're already passed on, you know, and not, not available to interview. Um, uh, or museum brochures, which is unlikely because museums aren't open now, but they may be available online, of course. Um, and they were printed. There's an example of a printed source that now it's digitalized, you see. So that would, that would qualify for uh, meeting the three new requirements, one of which should be originally a print source. Okay, and then of course there's documentaries. Right, I mean, uh, I know that uh, most of you have already used documentaries. That, well, I don't know, but it, it, it seems to be the, the accepted uh, practice and not just in my class or even art history, but in lots of college. Uh, courses now that you can use a, a, a documentary that's, you know, reputable. Obviously, we're not talking about QAnon or anything like that. We're talking about, you know, arts and history websites uh, that relate to the life of an artist. I would even include Hollywood movies in that. You're going to say, well, well, use that sparingly. I'll give you a good example. If you're writing about the life of the artist, and it works beautifully if you've just gotten extra credit for doing that and your paper's about the same artist, the work of art by that artist. Um, but you don't have to, you can just watch part of a documentary relating to, well, there's so many out there about Van Gogh, Gauguin, um, Picasso, uh, the, the list is endless. Um, so if that's, you know, a source you want to, then you need to know how to list each of these sources. So that's the, the latter part of this number four, that when you list these sources in your bibliography, it's very important. Please label it bibliography, not source cited. That's not the same thing. A lot of people somehow get confused about that. And that's why I'm here to, 
to clarify that. A bibliography means just that. It's a list of the sources that you may or may not choose to cite. You don't have to cite them all to get an A in the body of your paper. We'll get to that with number five, how to do that. So to finish up with number four, these sources, um, uh, we'll, there, I already said that in here. This bibliography, I'm sorry, it should be at the end of your paper, label clearly, and you should use MLA format. Now, some of you may know, I should have probably typed it or written it in here, so I'll do that right now. There's a source called noodlebib.com. It's a funny word, I know, hang on. I can't, don't usually have a pen in my pocket, but not this time. Um, so noodlebib is a good way to look up and if anyone wants to contribute another, there's a whole bunch of them. Uh, but this one has worked for my students for well over a decade. To look up, how do I cite in a bibliography correctly a documentary or an interview with the, uh, the artist or some expert historian? Looks like we got another one that wants to join here. Okay. So we should have, in other words, uh, you, sorry, you should have a pretty easy route. If you, here's, here's <laughs> noodle bib, just like the word noodle, see bib dot com. Um, bib, whoops, it's with a B. Uh, I apologize, noodle bib. Uh, it's, I'll spell it for you. Noodle as in the word, you know, the food, N O O D L E, and then B I B, bib. All one word dot com. Sorry, there we go. I like that. Okay, so at this point, I, I I think there's so many other sources. Anybody else want to chime in with another one? I know there's like at least. Uh, the chat says the um, Easy Bib and Noodle Tools. Uh, that was what I wanted to ask. Is this the same that uh, it's a Noodle Tools for site sources? The one that it's on the library page. Yeah, that's a variation of it. I was, I've been told recently, I didn't know that until like last semester. Yeah, the library, you know what, that's the other easy, even easier way. If you don't want to have to write down or, or remember a specific website and then, you know, call it up out of thin air, you can contact the library reference department and they'll be a, what's the word, uh, helpful tool. <laughs> That's what I call it, you know, online, you know, information on how to list any given sources in a bibliography. She used to be able to walk in the library and walk up to the, you remember where it was on the, was it the second floor of the reference desk and get a live person to stand there and give it to you. Can't do that now. So you could just go on the uh, library. Um, you, you can all navigate that better than I can, I'm sure. And you should be able to find uh, information on how to uh, list any source that you're using uh, correctly. Uh, and so that requirement um, isn't going to cost you a whole letter grade if you don't do it right, but it might be one or two points deducted out of the bibliography. Can you show the extra notes you wrote on the paper again yeah. for a second? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I wrote two sets of extra notes, and I'm going to cover the last one after we do number five. Noodle bib, I'm sorry, I, I uh, put the B and the D I, the, the juxtaposed. Noodle bib, unless they changed it in the last uh, semester, it was still this way. N O O D L E B I B dot com. But also the library at your your you know college. It, it's a good library. It's an excellent library. We had no library at Berkeley City College. Berkeley City, a feeder school for students from all over the world to go to UC Berkeley, and there was no library. Um, you had to go downtown Oakland which is in the same district, but good grief, that's a long drive around, not to mention parking headaches, uh, to go to a library in the Peralta district. They didn't have one for one of the most important. Uh, yeah, it was very, I taught there for many years. Yeah. Uh, anyway, so you guys have the advantage of having a well-run library and uh, a very competent staff, very friendly, helpful. Every time I've talked to them, they've been. So you could just go on the, you know, the JC website, go through to the library link, and then from there to, uh, MLA formats or, or cite, citing listing, sorry, but a bibliography list, li listing correct formats. And then they'll, you'll see, it. there'll be a way to, to uh, query about the specific type of sources you want to list. Okay, I said that there's a difference between bibliographies and cite, uh, sources uh, cited. 
I'm not going to take points off if you label your bibliography sources cited, but that could cause confusion uh, at some point. Not not usually for me because I've been doing this so many years, but some of the readers or otherwise just in general for yourself that you might not have done everything correctly. So here we go. Number five, this is where people miss more points than any other portion of the five requirements on this handout. So let me read it slowly, carefully and answer all your questions before I show you a sample paper. And then we'll get to tonight's lecture. Okay, number five, you must cite at least two of the sources from your bibliography. And if you are following along, you might want to underline or highlight within the text of your paper. That's what source I, sources cited are. And those can either be standard footnotes. I'm sure you all did that way as far back as middle school. So I'm not going to explain that. Footnotes or we give you a break. There's a, a, two other ways to do it. Uh, notations at the end of the, or sorry, one other way, notations at the end of the sentence or paragraph in which you used that source. Now, how do you do that? I give you an example. You'll see it on the sample paper. You should already have looked at those before class tonight that I sent you as a sample, but we'll go over it together in a few minutes. So for example, if you cite a printed source, it must be cited with the last name of the author, that's all you need, and the page number, of course, the page from which you got the fact or quote. You should do that if, in, you know, when you're writing your, your upper division papers, you're gonna have to do this for every fact, uh, if you want an A, and every quote. In my class, I'm giving a break. Two out of how, whatever, how many sources you have, that's pretty reasonable. Um, and, and those sources you should list either as a footnote uh, I mean, a site, sorry, I meant site in the body of your paper at the bottom of that page, which very few people do these days because it's cumbersome. Or you can do the shorter version of it where you do in parentheses, and I'll hold this up again. In parentheses, uh, you see there where I did wikipedia.com Michelangelo's David. That's an actual article source a lot of students have used when they write about that statue. Uh, which I'm not suggesting you do because I don't want to get 20 of the same paper, but that's up to you. You can write about any work of art. Remember, any work of art from any period, any culture, any uh, time frame, except your own. You have full freedom to choose what you want to write about. So you would do, if it's like Wikipedia, don't just give me Wikipedia. <laughs> that will be no credit for that. That's a couple points off right there. If you did that three or four times, you'd, you'd be dropping almost for sure a whole letter grade. It's pretty easy. You put the actual URL and then just the title, it's usually short, of the article from that website in parentheses. If it's a book though, you do it the way I just showed here where it's got, there's a book called Gardner's History of Art. I can tell you it's an excellent source, sort of supplements what, um, Stockstead covers. It's very multicultural and inclusive. It's a good text. So Gardner, if you use that book and it's in your bibliography and then you quote a fact or an actual full quote from it, and then you get to the end of that sentence, you put parentheses, Gardner, comma, and then the page number in parentheses. Okay. So that is really important because those last two items, numbers four and five combined are worth a total of 20 points. I've had people turn papers in where they would have had an A uh, and they did okay with the bibliography, but they forgot to cite a single source in the text, in the body of their text. And that, you know, right there lowers them several points and it could make the difference between an A and a B or a B and a C. Okay, now the last thing I'm gonna say, I did this right before class and I made sure I did it correctly. I had to do it twice because I didn't have it right the first time. Excuse me. <clears throat> yes, please go ahead. Um, does paraphrasing count as a quote? Can we be like this person said something along the lines of this, or does it have excellent, to be in quotation excellent points? question? And my feeling about that is, as someone who has been quoted and paraphrased, believe it or not, without credit in in some sources for my architecture books, not very often, but occasionally I'll see that in a brochure from a realtor or something. Yeah. Okay, I was a realtor. I think I told you that, and. Uh, yeah, I always give credit. Um, if if it's, uh, let me put it this way. I think I can keep it very straightforward and simple for you. If you use the fact 
it's not common knowledge. Like most people know what year the Declaration of Independence was written, right? That's not something you have to research. But if it's a fact, a date or something that, you know, or name that you wouldn't otherwise know, and you choose not to quote them, and you just sort of paraphrase what the author said about that, and you include in that paraphrasing the fact from, then yes, you should cite the source. You should. Yeah, just like you would with a footnote. But does that count as one of the two uh, source cited? If yes. you'd be like so and so said something along if, the lines. If it of this? comes from your bibliography, because that's how I check. I say, okay, that's a source you cited. Then I flip to your bibliography. See, oh, you listed it correctly in the bibliography, and it's a new source. Of course, I'll know. Okay. Stockstead, you'd say that you can use Stockstead, but uh, you should obviously you're going to have to do more than just the assigned text for. So yeah, in other words, but if you're just paraphrasing in the body of your, the, a point made by, you know, an interpretation made by that author, it's a little more complicated. And I would think almost everybody who's gotten this far in your, your academic lives, your, your educational life, your career, uh, college careers, whatever you want to call it, has, has had the, you know, quandary of, wow, should I really cite this source? I'm just, you know, I've already read this and I don't remember where it came from and I just remember these facts and I put this source in the bibliography as one. Uh, if it's not a fact, an actual specific fact or quote, I give you a pass on that. I probably shouldn't. I've been told that by other teachers. You should have the, you know, what is that plagiarism website thing? You know, I don't, some of my readers have been doing that for me. But I, I figure, oh, you know, honesty is the best policy for your own sake for future, you know, academic right grading and all that and credit and knowledge and, and professional career purposes. So whatever you do later with the knowledge you gain in any of these college classes, hopefully you got it and cited where if it was appropriate. So in other words, anytime you use a fact or an actual quote with quote marks around it, sorry, there we go you definitely need to cite that. Uh, but if it's paraphrasing, um, I leave that up to you, okay? okay. All right, any other questions? Because I was gonna segue to uh, the sample paper because we want to get to the lecture tonight, but we're, we're doing okay on time. Anybody have any questions about those first five requirements that are on that handout? All right, so let's do this. Uh, this you might want to take a screenshot of. I will send you an email and remind you, but it's too early now. You've got three weeks before the papers do, and you'd forget it and probably delete the email if I sent it to you this week anyway. So the week before the papers do, I will remind you, please label your PDF files and don't send me your papers in another format besides PDF. I'll bounce them right back to you. I just is too complicated, too time consuming to try and figure out if I can or can't open it. PDF, yes, everyone, as you now know, you've heard me say it for three weeks, in the entire JC is required both students and faculty to communicate, I mean, not to communicate, to, to send any documents or important, uh, you know, files as PDFs because they are universally openable, at least if you have the app, which of course, you all should have, because I did tell everyone that before class started, and I downloaded it myself. So uh, here we go. It's Art 1.1, short paper number one, underline, right? Last name, first name. If you do it that way, your paper will get graded more quickly, more efficiently, and, you, and I'll be able to, if you care, to get the grade from me directly, uh, as opposed to when they're all done, I might be able to even tell you your grade before uh, anyone who does. If, if you send me a paper as a PDF and it follows all those requirements, so it's still worth an A, but you don't label it that way, it goes to the back of the line. It'll get graded and, and not in a month. I never take that long, but you know, it might be a week later or something. So, so if you want a prompt response uh, and or have a question or want me to answer a question about your grades on any assignment, you need to label things the way I'm asking. So I'm only giving you the first paper that when we get to the midterm, there'll be another visual. I'll hold it that up. Does anybody need me to do that again for screenshot purposes? I think it's pretty straightforward. In my handwriting, I do know this is pretty neat. I know I've been told that anyway, <laughs> ever since third grade. Okay. So now finally, let's just take a quick look at a sample paper. You should have already had these 
well, you, everyone that was enrolled by, um, was it four o'clock today I sent this out? Uh, I definitely sent it to you if, you if you gave the college your correct email address. This is the cover sheet. You're going to get it. It's too early to send it to you again. I'll do this a week before the papers do. And this is how we grade your papers. You can see this was an A, 100 points, right? From a recently um, graduated student. Uh, and so what happens is we go down this checklist. So when you get this cover sheet, you should use it. I recommend it's your choice as a checklist for yourself for each of the papers. Uh, I mean, each of, sorry, I meant for each of the items you need to include. So that way you see, like, look at number um, two, which is the formal analysis. You see all those check marks? That means the person did all of these nine elements correctly. And at the bottom, it shows that it's checked also the last line that they, uh, they actually did give examples. Remember I said last week, if you should have uh, by now seen that lecture, if you missed it, you, again, you can catch it uh, after 7 p.m. on Friday on YouTube. Uh, the requirement for an A is two or more examples for each of these nine elements. So this person did all of that and they got, you see the full 30 points. You get 10 points just for submitting the paper. That's like getting paid some sports right figures for just suiting up, right? So you get 10 points right off the bat, then 20 for the formal analysis, and I'm sorry, 30, 30 for the formal analysis. And then meaning, if it's too short, you get points off, but if it's long enough and you cite at least two sources for the facts or quotes you use in the meaning, you'll get 20 points. And then for length, that's where we do the, the uh, line count. If it's a full length or you know minimum of 23 lines on each half or more, you get 10 points again. Then uh, second from the bottom is the illustration. That's worth 10 points. If you do the full you know page and it's you know or at least a half a page or larger and it's in color. And last but not least, you see how important it is to uh, label your bibliography and give me at least three new sources and cite at least two of them in your text. Because if you do all that, you get 20 more points, and that totals up to 100. So. I'm not going to show you each page of the paper, but I am going to go ahead and show you a sample of how these were cited. Here's an example. Um, an author that was in the bibliography, uh, whoops, too close, I think, is cited as, let me see if I can point to it. I can see it right there. <laughs> there it is. Guggen, G, whoops, sorry. It's hard to do this in reverse. I could never have read any of Da Vinci's notebooks. You guys know what he did, right? He wrote everything in the mirror backwards just to confuse later generations. Uh, anyway, the point is that I think you can see. Now, why don't I just turn it this way? There we go. See there, Guggen, G-U-E, that's the name of one of the authors of one of the books in the bibliography, last name only, and then the page number for that fact, a quote. And this... Um, student did it two different times for two different sources. It, it's two different sources, not just the same source twice, if you want to meet that requirement. Um, and in fact, uh, this one also did it with the URL, I think. Let me see if that's in here. I think it is. This is on a painting by Toulouse-Lautrec that um, was at a museum exhibit, so they could have used that. Um, oh, here we go, yeah. Yeah, they, no, this person used two uh, printed sources. That, this is, of course, before the, uh, the pandemic, before the uh, era of Zoom classes, but it, it still gets across the main concept here. This was happened to be, there was no page number for this. It was a brochure, I believe, from the museum. Pretty sure that's what it was. And then finally, I'll show you the bibliography, and then, then we'll move on to the lecture. Uh, slides, I mean, for the lecture, uh, if you have answered all your questions. See how thorough and obviously clear, you know, not a muddy image. You get points off of that, too, if it's not clear. I, I already said that, didn't I? It's in, it's in the five requirements. You can give me something in color and the right size, but if it's just a big muddy wash and we can't tell one detail from another, you get a bunch of points off of that. Because, of course, we can't tell if you're correctly analyzing each of the elements. And then here is the uh, bibliography, and, and this proves my point. I am a little too lenient. This shouldn't be work cited. It should say bibliography, but I didn't take points off because they did everything correct with the MLA format here, sorry. 
uh, and, and they had at least three new sources. And at least one of them was a print source, as it says right here, a book, an actual book back when, and there's that author's name, Gugan. It almost sounds like the painter Gugan, but it's not somebody else who wrote about Toulouse-Lautrec and this painting. So this is the format of an A paper. It was three pages of, of main text, double space. You can see that, right? I'll show you one more time, right? And well over 23 lines in each half. So that met the length requirement, right? And then you see that uh, if we could do it hand printed, we would, we can't do that anymore. But it's just too complicated to write notes in the margin. But we do give you a comment at the end of each paper, I and my readers, We'll give you a summary as to what you did well and if you were missing anything. So you understand how you got the grade you got. And then you'll also know how many points you got total and, and how you got those points, or if you missed any. Okay, that's the first major task for tonight, but let's now uh, take a moment just to double check. Does anybody have any questions now before we move on to the uh, slide portion? In the example that you showed us, yes. she had the formal analysis labeled. Do we have to do that with the meaning as well? Or yes, just yes, like separate yes. pages? Well, that's what I was saying in, 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 in the five requirements. If you, if you see it, uh, look at it again. Um, number one, please keep these two sections separate and label them. Yes. Mm -hmm. and, and the easiest so thing have... is to yeah, make it either bold or all caps um, or underline it. So it's, okay. um, yeah. Yes, you should do that because otherwise we might not be sure where one begins and the other ends or one ends and the other begins. <laughs> all right, so now you should all have your syllabi or syllabus, each of you individually, in front of you for tonight. And we are going to uh, talk about, let me give you a little context. This is, historic context is something that isn't always available when, um, you know, you, you, you uh, see lectures or, or, or even documentaries about a certain culture, a certain period or type or movement of art. I try to give you that because for one reason, the textbook doesn't always have as much information as you might otherwise want. And you don't have to take notes until I tell you. Now we're getting to the first must know and you'll see that on the syllabus. So you always get a, a heads up when it's time to start taking notes, but you might want to take notes during this uh, introductory, you know, two or three minutes is all I give you, uh, overview or context, uh, background, if you want to call it that, for each culture that we're covering. Because we're covering cultures from, from you know, five continents, yeah, uh, over 15,000 years in this class. So you can't know, even if you are ex you're a history major and you studied lots of cultures, no one person can know all this. So this is, you know, from all the years of teaching and traveling to over, well over half of these sites in this uh, syllabus. Okay, so tonight we're talking about ancient art or art of the ancient Near East. Okay, and that, another way of saying it, I'm, I know I'm simplifying it. Some of you may know this. A lot of stories just call that whole area Mesopotamia. And that's as uh, acceptable as any other phrase. Uh, but others have slightly incorrectly labeled that whole period of the early, early urban cultures in what we today, geographically, we're talking about the Middle East. And how is that defined? Uh, usually from North Africa, some people stretch all the way over to Morocco, but certainly at least through from Egypt, uh, all the way up through Turkey, and over as far as Persia. So from Persia, on the uh, right e uh, east to Turkey on the west end of the so-called Middle East is what we're covering tonight, these areas. And south as far as the Arabian Peninsula and uh, lower Egypt. Okay, we are gonna cover Egypt tonight though. That'll come up next week. So what are we covering? Most of the artwork is from Babylon and that's a specific culture that dominated that area of the world for well over 1500 years and was one of the first. Now this fact you might want to write because it applies to all the slides tonight is one of the facts you could use on the exam under meaning, okay? For the essay part of the, we're gonna talk about how to study and how the tests are given you know, the week before. So you don't need to worry about that yet, but just say that you will have to write short, short essays, a couple of paragraphs for several slides on the midterm. 
Okay, so this could be helpful information if you choose to write it down. <clears throat> then we'll get to the first slide in about uh, a minute here. Okay, so what are, what is the importance of why do we spend a whole week, you know, a whole unit on this one area of the world in this period? Because the ancient Near East, or you can call it Mesopotamia, and it's okay to just say Babylon because that was the dominant culture for most of this period. So if you just want to say Babylon and or the ancient Near Eastern cultures was one of only five urban civilizations on earth that began over 5,000 years ago. Or the other way to say it, it is one of the uh, few civilizations on earth that began urban sorry urban it's important to say urban civilizations that began over 5000 years ago that go back you know more than 5000 years egypt if you're curious what the others are i'll repeat this when we get to the each of these yeah babylon and or mesopotamia which is tonight's topic next week egypt i'm sure you all know it's over well over 5000 years old i think it's 5500 years ago the first uh, empires in Egypt were founded. We'll talk about that next week. And then China, right? India. And can you guess the fifth one? Anybody? From 5,000 years back, that was an urban civilization. Uh, the uh, Native American Indians down in... Uh, the, yeah. The, what? Yes, you got it. Yes. Uh, right. Some people you used to say pre-Columbian, and we know that's, you know, not considered, you know, politically correct now for a lot of reasons. But whatever, you'll see it still occasionally. So you, you could say uh, Mesoamerica or um, the ancient native cultures, right, of Central America and South America. But mostly Central because the Incas, are, they're old, but they're not 5,000 years old. They're, of course, in what's now Peru and along the Andes. So really, it's Central America, an amazing cities. I don't know, any of you been to, I bet several of you have, right, or you're from. <laughs> What classifies a city as urban? Oh, well, I think I know what your question is, but the way you ask it is kind of ironic. Urban and city are two words that aren't quite synonyms, but close. Uh, yeah, we're talking about, uh, well, actually, if you're actually, you could even look at it this way, trying to um, quantify it. Back in the ancient world, a big city was 50,000 people. Until you get to Rome, that that totally is a different. Rome was the megalopolis. It would match up with many such cities today. But that that's very late in the end of the ancient world, right? It was the Roman Empire. Uh, but the point is around 5,000 is usually considered the minimum population of a an urban center to be considered a city in the ancient world. And have that would usually imply it has divided labor. Does that sound like? you know, socialist doctrine, what well, it is actually. Marx talked about that. But you have to be a, you know, Marxist historian to understand the concept. People specialized in what they did and that allowed different techniques and early, of course, prehistoric. And at the beginning, it was even prehistoric. There were cities in the prehistoric time. So involved. in order to be classified as urban, it needs to have sections of divided labor? Yes, you said it oh. right. Yes, yes, that, that's the bottom line. It really is because that allowed, yeah, that allowed uh, development of, you know, different kinds of housing and farming tools and transportation and, and you know, measuring, you know, because people specialize and became experts. Yeah, that's the bottom line. Okay, let's get to our first slide, um, which is your first must know, of course, and it's a really important one. So important, I won't be cutting it from the study list. Now, I am going to hide these. Let's see, where do we do this? Hide the thumbnails, okay. And get this larger. Okay, this is a very important uh, slide. I, I think you wanna make sure you take thorough notes because it has a high possibility of being on the midterm. Okay, face of a woman from Uruk. That's U-R-U-K. Face of a woman from Uruk. The location is Iraq. You see, we give you the current location of the country that's there and that now, you know. So, of course, there was no countries like we think of today in the ancient world. Iraq, and the date is 3500 BC or BCE. 
Okay, so that makes this over 5,000 years old. Right there, that proves the point I was just making, that this is from one of the earliest Mesopotamian, or you can just say ancient Near East. And if you want to say ancient Middle East, that's okay too. But Middle East is usually considered a little broader. It's usually considered to go all the way out to the edge of North Africa. Uh, and th this is more what we most people would call meso, yes, M-E-S-O-P-O, Tamia, T. A M I A. You don't have to worry about the spelling of the words I give you in your lecture notes unless it's on the syllabus. Okay, so Mesopotamia or the ancient Near East, this is one of the oldest artifacts ever found. And it's from an urban civilization. They had cities by this time. But guess what? Is all part of the meaning now. So you should already be taking notes that this is a prehistoric artifact. You know, that might surprise a few people. What? There was urban civilization in prehistoric times? Toward the end of the prehistoric era, before written records were kept. Remember, that's the definition we covered it last week of prehistoric societies. It doesn't mean that they're necessarily, you know, uh, quote, backward or undeveloped or, or, or that. It, it just means there was no written records kept. So this is a period when urban civilization was just getting started in the ancient Near East. And this is the most important fact about it. It is the oldest intact, well, okay, your eyes are missing because they were made out of something other than stone. So just the stone is, itself is intact. So I'll just say it again. This is the oldest intact life-size image of a woman's face yet found in Western art. There is no other way to say that. I'll repeat it uh, once quickly. Uh, this is the oldest intact life-size image of a woman's face uh, yet found in Western art. That's pretty important. And this piece played a role in the invasion of Iraq or the aftermath of it back in 2003. That's at the end. I'll give you that fact for those who want to write that as part of the meeting. But let's talk about what this piece is first. Well, we just said it's a face of a woman, right? But that doesn't tell us anything. Who was she? We don't know an identity or even if it is specific. So here's how to write this part of the notes on the meaning. Uh, there are two main theories about uh, this uh, piece, th this artifact. One is that it's an actual portrait of a specific high ranking woman, someone who was probably one of the ruling class, you know, a priestess. And if was, she was a priestess, she would have been a high priestess, you know, with a capital H, you know, like maybe the head priestess uh, or a noble woman, a high ranking woman, you could say, but noble woman would work, you know, from the ruling classes of that urban center, uh, which was a city in what's now Iraq. Back then it was, we just call it Babylon. Why does Were these societies story... egalitarian? Oh, excuse Pardon? Me. Sorry. No, go ahead. Were these were these societies more egalitarian? Uh, like Most, no, no, but there were exceptions. And that's always been the case, isn't it? You know, where uh, male, almost always male dominated societies throughout the ancient world, the medieval world, and even now, right? We all know that. But the point is that the exceptions were usually women that were high born, but not always. Sometimes they did work their way from you know the lower ranks of society to a position of importance we we don't know just... who this person was in general to answer your question no they weren't egalitarian but there are a couple of exceptions you may have heard of the amazons we'll briefly talk about them when we get to greek art and you may have heard of the minoans they were the most amazing culture in terms of egalitarian treatment of uh, their whole population they, they really were a rare exception but in general no there wasn't a equality among the sexes or classes i was just uh, curious because it's a woman and they like if they're making statues of a woman that kind of suggests that it might be egalitarian well because... it, it, just that in one sense the priesthood was more it's a good point yeah to, to clarify it the priesthood um okay someone's wanting to be admitted here we go Okay, the priesthood in many of these ancient near, or just say ancient cultures period. And you know, that means male and female priests were given different ceremonies to conduct. But often the female high priest was as important or considered as, important as a male high priest. So this woman here, let's move on to say what, what the historian said. Uh, sure, uh, the, the idea is that 
if she was a high ranking female, how do we, why do many historians think that? We don't know that, but I think it is. And here's why, look at this all part of the meeting now. First of all, look at her hair. You notice something about it? Is that just a natural, you know, you know, loose hairstyle? No, it's been styled. Her hair has been styled. It has been treated. However you want to say that, I would say styled. Well, that you wouldn't have that opportunity if you were a lower class or lower ranking female uh, in any urban civilization. In her hair is very symmetrical too. It looks yeah, like. right. That's true. It's so so that's all part of how we can tell she had her hair style. If if this is a report a portrait of an individual, you know, who actually once lived, you know, done from life, this theory then would be based on these facts. Already, I mentioned the hair. The hair has been styled. Okay, what else? Look at her gaze. Look at the way, if you can imagine, there were eyes of precious metal set, and that's why they were probably stolen a long time ago when this was found. This piece was lost and found and then lost and found several times throughout history. And I'll explain the last time that happened at the end of these notes. But anyway, just say that once it would have had the eyes, but even without them, you know, inserted here. If you squint, and my father taught me that as an artist, you get a more overall impact of an image, of any kind of visual image, uh, especially with close up like this. You can see that she's gazing right at us and there is no hesitancy, no reluctance, you know, no holding back. She's looking dead straight on at her viewers or at us. And then finally, the third clue and I like this as much as the others, is the firm set of her jaw and her expression on her mouth. So if you put the firm expression, you can just keep it simple, say that way, the direct gaze and the styled hair together, you have enough evidence to, to reasonably assume that she probably, if it was an actual portrait of a real person, would have had to have been a, an important person in that urban center, that city um, in ancient Babylon. Um, okay, what other thing I'll say, anybody here want to just holler out, what quality could you attribute to someone like I just described with these features, if it's an actual portrait? This woman had what quality that important or high ranking or leaders, you know, members of society were leaders, would, would have had that. Somebody said it, what? Powerful. That's a good word. You had a position uh, of power. Yeah. Yeah, that would sort of uh, attack with what we were saying about her rank. Well, I meant a, a, a character, quality of character. Okay, we're, we're running a little behind, so I'll just, supreme self-confidence. I think that to me, it just screams that or jumps out at you when you look at this face. I have not seen the original piece. I have seen pieces like it in the museums in uh, Syria, Jordan, and Egypt. I've been all over all, all three of those countries before the civil wars <laughs> that started there. Um, yeah, and, and I've seen pieces like this. And when you look into the face of one of these, you can't help but feel the power of the person, yes, but also their self-confidence. I would even say supreme. Yes. Where did this piece uh, were found initially? Because you know how in Central America, the the cities, the urbanization used to be separate, like the sacerdotes live on one part of the city, and then the like hand crafters live on another part. Yes, that's so, true. I, I, but I, I, you're you're absolutely correct with what you just said. Do you have hear. any idea um, where was initially found this piece? Okay. I'm sorry, I don't know that. It was found buried for thousands of years in the desert, that I do know, of what's now Iraq. And I believe it was found in the 1920s or 30s, because at that time, Europeans ruled that area, as you may know. Iraq was under, I think, British, what does it just say European colony. And so European archaeologists were allowed to do whatever they wanted to take, whatever that you know this, right? There were exceptions, but most of the time, these pieces were taken out. But this piece was not removed. It was taken to Baghdad, but I don't, which was the capital then and still is of Iraq. Um, I don't know where it was found. Sorry, if I when I know, I'll, I'll, I'll always tell you guys. But you could look that up for extra credit, of course, if you want to, or if you wrote a paper about this, that'd be part of it. Okay, now let's move on to oh, the other theory is that it's a generic image 
of a, a woman from maybe the priest class or, or you know, some kind of professional class of woman. And it's not a portrait of an individual. But to me, the, the details I just already gave you do speak loudly to the fact that most, and therefore most historians believe that this is an actual portrait of a real person. That's it for the meaning, except for the last fact. What happened right after the invasion of Iraq in 2003 by the US military, uh, the fall of Baghdad. Months later, it wasn't in the looting of the museum. You know, that museum was looted. Now, don't write this until I I'll summarize it at the end. This is, it's, it's a bit of a 90 second or two minute anecdote. And then we'll get to the formal elements and move on. Um, this, this piece went missing or disappeared from the museum months after the sacking or looting of that museum. So it didn't happen right after the fall. And it turned out it was an inside job. And how do we know? Because the person who stole it worked for the museum and was arrested for having stolen it and buried it in his backyard as part of the plan he had to sell it for $10 million. And you know it's worth much more if he was going to sell it for that on the black market to a German art collector, excuse me, thief, a German thief. Anybody that would buy something like that is a criminal. Anyway, so they were both criminals. Guess how it was retrieved is one of the few happy stories you can come up with for that, that unambiguously had a happy ending early on of our, after our occupation of Iraq. Uh, there was a neighbor who saw that person digging it up or, or burying it. I'm not sure what doesn't matter. Saw the person you know, who stole it, burying it in their backyard and uh, gave a tip to the uh, local American military commander in that neighborhood. And they came and dug it up, found it. It was intact. It was, you know, covered in burlap bag or something. It was protected in the ground. They arrested the man, turned him over to the Iraqi police and brought the head back. And that's where it is now under much stricter security. So you could just say, um, you know, you know, in, in the early 2000s, to, you don't have to say that. You could just say shortly after the fall of Baghdad, this piece was stolen by someone who worked at the museum and was recovered by American soldiers after a tip and replaced in the museum where it belongs. It's been there nearly 100 years on display. Okay. Is it just a head? Like, does it look like it used to be part of a bust or was it like a freestanding head? just a head, head and that's a good question. Uh, we are running a little late, so I'll keep it brief because uh, we, we need to pick up the pace, but it's an important question. Uh, I disagree with Stockstead's labeling of certain works of art more often than, than many other professors might, because every other source I've ever seen calls this head of a woman from, um, right, Uruk. Uruk was a city in ancient Babylon. Okay, so it was never a full body, we know, because the bottom is, is down here. This is uh, blocked off, but, you know, the stone ends right there. Uh, so no, it was not part of it. It's a good guess, but, but it isn't just a face, is it? But that's what Stockstead calls it. So I'm using her title. So it doesn't confuse you when you're looking in your textbook, but it really ought to be more correctly labeled head of a woman. Obviously it's not just her face. It's three-dimensional, right? Not two-dimensional. Okay. So let's wrap up the formal analysis. We've got to do that quickly. It's a warm color, warm yellow, off yellow. It's completely balanced as our most intact or complete, we could say either way, a human uh, heads, right? Full of the rhythm of the two eyes or eye sockets, if you prefer. And of course, eyebrows, the bangs, what else are those bangs, right? And the two lips and the two ears. So it's got lots of rhythm. It is almost entirely stable. The overall shape and pose of this woman is dead straight, right on upright. And yet there are lots of dynamic details. So it's both obviously the eye sockets, the uh, eyebrows, the hair, uh, and to lesser degree, the lips. So there's some of both, but it's mostly overall, the shape of it is stable. It's a single mass. The only technique for space, here's how you write about space. It's life-size image of a woman's head with overlapping of the hair on the forehead. That's it, there's no other technique for space. Uh, the textures are the real rough texture of the stone, but I see simulated texture on the hair. Looks like it's been smoothed or plastered down by a cosmologist or whatever they call themselves, a beautician. Um, <clears throat> so there's some simulated texture. The lips have some. Uh, the nose was damaged, not by the guy that stole it. That was thousands or hundreds of years ago, probably. Uh, but other than that, most of the texture you see is the real rough texture of the actual stone. 
and there's no technique for modeling. There's just shadows from the museum, of course. And then finally, there's carved line that creates the uh, textures and the details. Okay, this is also an important one, one I'm not going to cut from the study list. Uh, and it's our first definition for tonight. Uh, okay, so this is ziggurat. It's the fourth one down on your syllabus. Ziggurat of Ur. And that's, I, again, since they're on your syllabus, I only spell these words once so we can keep moving forward. Z-I-G-G-U-R-A-T. Ziggurat of Ur, that's capital U-R. It was a city, of course, in ancient Babylon. Iraq, again, is the country where it is now. 2100 or 2100 BC. So here's your first definition for tonight, a ziggurat. A ziggurat, it's not a long one, but you want to write this definition exactly the way I give it to you because some people get mixed up and uh, don't use it correctly. But of course, you'll have it in front of you when you do the exams, right? Uh, it could easily be on the midterm. Ziggurat is a Babylonian stepped pyramid, comma, a Babylonian stepped, right with an ED, stepped pyramid, comma, sometimes used as a fortified city, sometimes used as a fortified city. That's what we're looking at here. This is a ziggurat that also was used not just as a pyramid for religious services or as a tomb like the Egyptians did, they never made these in, the Egyptians didn't make their pyramids into fortified cities, but the Babylonians often did. And this one was. Now, how can that be? This is all part of the meaning, of course. You should uh, have labeled your notes already as meaning. Uh, I always start with the meaning, right? Uh, so how did they make a fortified city out of this? Well, you might be able to guess that this is only the bottom level of what was once, now this you wouldn't know by looking, was a three level or three tier you could say the other way, three level or three tier uh, stepped pyramid, which was a total of 200 is a, a very, we know now because there are actual images of this Babylonian ziggurat when it was new in ancient artwork found in what's now Iraq. So we have images of how it looked, we don't have to guess. It was three tiers when it was finished or new and it rose to a height of 220 feet. That's pretty tall for something from the ancient world. So how did they use those three levels? This is the main part of the meeting now. Where the arrow is, the first level, you could probably guess who lived there. The poor people, <laughs> the peasants, the working class. Any of those phrases will too. You, you, again, you don't have to get Marxist about it. You know, the, the proletariat, right? But the people who obviously had very no real power or wealth, they just worked their lives, you know, all their lives to survive. So just keep it simple and say that on the first level were the mud, and they were mud huts, basically. You could say houses, but they were small little hut-like houses. So the mud huts or mud houses of the working class or peasants. And there were hundreds of such houses on this level. If you look at it, you can see that 1954 Chevy there. You can get you some scale. This is a very old photo, obviously. Um, so if you could do the math, each house had at least two families back then. That was common living under the same roof. And so if every family back then had 15 people, that was the common. We're not talking about one couple having 13 kids, no. We're about three generations, right? That's the norm. It still is in much of the world, right? You know, parents, grandparents, and children or grandchildren all under the same roof. So if you had 15 people times two, that's 30 people in each house. And you, you don't have to be a math whiz to do that. You do it on a piece of paper or in your head multiply that by say seven, 800, maybe even a thousand houses because they went all the way around these mud huts and they were really close together. So they packed them in tightly like all poor neighborhoods, right? Uh, so, so you end up with, you know, several thousand people living on the first level, all peasants or, or, or uh, working class. The second level, you probably guess, was the skilled laborers. Here's where that conversation we had, I think it was Amanda, it was, I, can't, I think it was you, yeah asked that question that was helpful at the start, which is that this qualifies as an urban center or city on a ziggurat because it had divided labor. So what does that mean on the second level? You had the skilled laborers, the merchants, the shopkeepers, 
the artisans, craftsmen, and uh, maybe some craftswomen, but mostly they were male, uh, you know, who were skilled, who, who, you know, carpenters, stone and bricklayers. And they got a little better housing. They didn't share their houses with several families, but they still had, you know, large extended families. And on that level, there was, you know, maybe a couple hundred houses on the second level. And if there were 15 people in each house, right there, you've got nearly another thousand people. And then, yes, you could guess the final thing about the, um, you know, use of this as a city is the third level had the homes of the ruling class, of course. And those were fancy, large stone houses. I think the ones on the middle level were wood, but I'm not sure about that. You can just say they were a little nicer than the mud huts below them. And at the upper level were the most solidly built, you know, you could just say fancy stone homes of the wealthy and their servants, of course. And finally, in the middle of the third or uh, top level would have been the temple of the city god. That's the only way to say it. They all believe that each city had their own god back then. They had common gods, of course, that the religions taught them throughout Babylon and throughout their empire, but each city had its own god. So just keep that part brief and say uh, the, the final um, you know, structure or building on the upper level was the city temple in which was a statue of the city god that, of course, they prayed to. And the, the last fact about the meaning is, you probably already can guess this, these staircases were used in times of danger, of attack. And so what you have here is the retreat route for people out in the fields. Of course, most of the peasants didn't, didn't sit in their homes all day. They went out and worked and you know, probably 12 hour days, you know, worked themselves into an early grave, whatever they, they were, you know, harvesting and, you know, building things, you know, for the rest of the city. And so if the, you know, workers were out in the field and someone was approaching an enemy, you know, an army or, or a group of, uh, you know, uh, thugs, robbers, whatever criminals coming to attack them, they would hear a horn. Of course, what else would it be, right? Someone blowing a horn and they would, oops, hang on. At a moment where the internet is, I'll repeat this. Okay, now it says it's stable again. I'll say that again. If there was an imminent attack, the people, uh, the working people would be in the field. They'd be warned by someone standing at this gate. The gate is missing, of course, but the opening's there. And they would, just at the sound of a horn, the people would rush up these stairs and then the gate would be lowered and they'd be protected. Of course, protected. That's why we say fortified city. So and they would- what? What we're seeing now is that just the first level visible yes, that's with the mud it. huts that's like it. on ground level, or were they up the stairs a little? Oh no, this was a flat here. It's missing most of it, and it was as wide as the edges. So that's how you could get hundreds of mud huts on this level. Okay, so what we're seeing is only the first level, the second and third are completely gone. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Okay. And so that's that's pretty much the whole meaning. The only other thing you could add, if you want to, you have more than enough notes already. But these little windows, let's get up close, are where the archers stood. Of course, the soldiers, 24-7, there were soldiers guarding the city. Of course, they took turns and they could see someone approaching. And if the, if the uh, you know attackers came too close, they could shoot them with their arrows or even flaming arrows. They actually did have those in ancient history. And so that was used to defend it as well as the gates or gate, sorry, it was just one gate being lowered. So it, rarely were these things ever, uh, you know, occupied by an enemy because they were so well fortified. That's why they used them as often as fortified cities. By the way, it's still there and it doesn't look any different. I had uh, a husband and wife of all things that joined the army at the same time, unfortunately for them, right before, like in 2002, right before the Iraq war and they were sent there and they brought back photos and showed them as slides in my class for extra credit and, and they went and visited the site. It's actually protect, was protected by US military uh, personnel from, you can guess, the early, you know, ISIS, Al Qaeda type terrorist attacks that destroy other cultures and their own, they even, you know, so, yeah. anyway, the point is it, it's not been damaged any more than it was, which was thousands of years ago. When the Romans came here, it looked like this. The Romans occupied this whole area, of course. And so it had already been, you know, allowed to decay or deteriorate, you know, with time and, and weather, you know, thousands of years ago, but it hasn't been any further damage. That's not something you have to write unless you want to. Okay, let's do a formal analysis. The only thing I can tell you about the 
uh, color is I don't have any color photos. These are the three that slide library had had. So we're going to use this one because it's the sharpest and clearest image. But I, I can tell you from seeing photos that it's a sanded color. And that's obviously a warm tone. And then we have the texture. Well, there isn't any similar texture. It's the real rough texture of brick uh, over stone, right? Uh, the, the, the core of it is stone, but the exterior is made of bricks. And those are both rough, real textures. And then we have the rhythm of the staircases and the small windows. That's really the only two main rhythms you can see clearly in this picture. Is it stable or dynamic? Well, it's both because the edges of the walls are mostly, right, and some portion of the gateway here uh, are mostly stable, right? These sections here, these are called pilasters. You don't have to write that, but, you know, or, or buttresses. They help support the wall. They're just projections of brickwork. But the point is that those are all stable, but the edges of the actual pyramid, of course, and the stairs, right? The edges and the stairs are obviously dynamic. Okay, then it's completely symmetrical as all pyramids would be, left to right and not symmetrical, or of course, unbalanced or weighted toward the bottom, obviously. And then we have um, the uh, modeling is just the shadows from the sun and the lines are visual. Remember with architecture, lines are usually just where the shadows create the illusion of, of a line, like here. Right uh, and and all these windows. So so there is no carved or, or painted line. It's just visual line, and it's really all one mass. But you could have broken it down when it was new and had all three sections into three masses. The largest mass being the the lower level, the second largest, the middle level, and the smallest mass, the top level. Okay, um, moving on. Uh, this is also a pretty important one. I can't say for sure whether or not I'll, I'll cut it, uh, but you know, just take good notes. And this one has some humor to it, and uh, it will involve two new definitions, which uh, I'll give you as we go here. But the title of this one is "Panels," as in you know, plural panels from a bull liar. And we're not talking about a bull that doesn't tell the truth. We're talking about a musical instrument. Panels from a Bull Lyre, L-Y-R-E. It's a musical, ancient musical instrument. The location, again, you see almost all of these are the same country, Iraq. And the date, 2685 BC. Well, that's very specific. How do we know? I'll tell you how. We do know the exact year it was created. But you don't have to. If it's on the exam, you can just write 2680 or apostrophe S. Okay, so what are we looking at? We're looking at a bas relief. Here's your... Uh, second new definition for tonight. It's not a long one. It's, it's very short. It's on your list. You see that here at the bottom of the first page of the list of terms. No. Bow relief is a two dimensional work of art with raised figures off of a flat background. If I get up close, I think you can see that these figures are raised, maybe just a fraction of an inch. It doesn't matter how much. With a flat back, I'll say it again. A bow relief is a two dimensional work of art with raised figures off of a flat background. That's exactly what this qualifies as a type of bow relief. But what is it? It is a musical instrument, an ancient early form of a harp. You can say harp like instrument. Uh, they don't make them anymore, but back then they, they were very popular for entertainment. So that's what a lyre is. But what is going on in the uh, panels, each of these four panels? These are examples. Now, this definition is a little longer. It's the third one from tonight, but you see where it is there near the bottom of the first page. Animal style. Animal style, here we go, is a style of ancient art, comma, in which animals are depicted with human-like characteristics sorry, comma again, in which animals, I'll repeat the whole thing at the end, in which animals are depicted with human-like characteristics, comma, and often engaged in human-like behavior, period, and often engaged in human-like behavior. So it's a style of ancient art in which animals are shown with human-like characteristics and often engaged in human-like behavior. Well, that's exactly what we see here. So let's get a little more up close and you can see the uh, 
details. Whoops, sorry, it does that a lot. Here we go. There. What's the first panel, the top panel? Well, that is a uh, superhuman. A hero is what the word would have been originally. Today we have somewhat different connotation of the word hero or there are many, right? But in the ancient world, a hero was half human and half God. There's no question that all the ancient cultures right on through the Romans, everyone we're gonna study before the midterm, all of those ancient cultures uh, believe that humans and gods mated occasionally and the result was a hero, a strong man or woman. They didn't have to be women. Uh, I mean, uh, only men, there were women who were heroines, if you want to say right, or female heroes too. Not, but most of them were, were, of course, strong men like Hercules, Achilles. You've heard these names. We'll get to them when we get to the Greeks. So this is an early version of a superhuman, of course, a man in this case, and he's a hero. He's half God, half human. Uh, how do we know he's superhuman? Well, look at what he's doing. He's crushing two bowls in his arms. I don't know if anyone here has ever been on a farm or been to a uh, place where bulls walk around <laughs> freely. Don't ever get stepped on one. They can weigh up to two tons or not two tons, one ton. Why do the bulls have his face? Okay, that's the animal style. They're not his face. They're just human faces with similar features. Of course, uh, they, they do look similar. So in other words, these are half you know, animal and half human or part human, I should say. That's part of the animal style. It's just a feature of this period of art in the ancient or this type, I meant to say this type of art in the ancient world. Uh, there was usually a myth associated with it and there's no specific myth that I've read about this scene. There may be by now, there could easily be research saying, okay, we think that, you know, historians can't be sure because there's no written records kept except for one, the year it was created. We know, I forgot to tell you this part of the meaning, that this was created as a, a musical instrument to entertain the royal palace. It was found in the ruins of one of those royal palaces, you know, maybe of a governor, you know, somebody of royal rank, you know, the rulers were always, you know, they always had to be, right, noble birth or noble rank to be a ruler usually sometimes they were appointed uh so this was a royal uh, uh it was found i'm sorry this piece was found in the ruins of a, of a of a royal palace in ancient babylon uh and it was used to entertain the royal family you know or and their guests the instrument itself we'll see the instrument in just a minute okay so this panel you can keep it simple say it depicts a uh, a superhuman slash hero crushing two uh, adult bulls who have human heads. That's part of what makes this animal style. Okay, let's go further down now. Um, let's see, I think I can, yeah, here we go. I like this panel, I think, almost as much as the, the last, this one is my favorite. What's going on here? Well, these are the party servers. You see a lion and a jackal, right? walking upright on their hind legs. And this one's carrying a wine jug and a wine goblet. That's how wine goblets looked back then. And this one's carrying cooked heads of his own species. <laughs> it's meant to be humorous. This is meant to elicit a grin, a smile, a chuckle from anyone who saw it while they're listening to the long, boring harp. I shouldn't say that. <laughs> Anybody see the Grouch the Marx Brothers? Harpo? Nobody knows what I'm talking about. There was a character in the 1930s. Uh, four brothers they were called the Marx Brothers and one of them played harp and that was the only parts of those movies I couldn't sit through I'd have to fast forward because it was like a 15 minute or 20 minute harp solo but back I love then Harpo Marx. Yeah, yeah Harpo Marx yeah well I, he was funny as a yeah I, of course he as a comedian he was hilarious but you know he had to show off his harp skills right okay so someone would have played the harp here for probably hours what other kind of entertainment would they have wine and of course other activities that go with orgies but not only they might just sit and listen to music and this would be how they would be entertained partly by the panels on the actual harp like instrument looking at them and making amusing comments or just laughing and guessing what's going on so here we have in the second panel uh, you know, a, a lion and a jackal, right? You can just keep it simple. Who uh, one is carrying food, i.e. cooked heads, and the other wine to, to a party somewhere in the royal palace. And then we have um, this one, 
is actually my favorite panel, the musicians panel. We have a bear snapping his paws, look at that, in time to the music. And here we have a donkey playing, guess what? There it is, that's the actual instrument this is a part of. So it's an image within an image, right? I mean, it's kind of, this is very sophisticated for this far back in the ancient time. But my favorite thing is the two-fisted, I don't know what that's from the slide library. It's a two-fisted drinking goat. He's, he's got, a, you know, while he's going, you know, as if they could hold in their hoof a wine glass. And that glass actually looks like a real glass, like a modern wine glass. In any case, he's drinking, enjoying himself. This guy, uh, this this upright bear, is you know listening to the music and snapping his his uh, paws in time to the rhythm, and this donkey is playing the instruments. I mean, you can see the the humor, even if it doesn't elicit a chuckle out of anybody today. It would have back then. And then down here, the last panel is a scorpion man. I don't know what else to say. He's half scorpion, half human. Uh, dressed the upper part of his the, the beard and all that, and the scroll he's got is he's probably a priest. And then here we have actually this is the that's the one fisted. Here's the two fisted drinking goat. Look, at him. he's got human hands, of course, and he's uh, enjoying the company of the scorpion guy. I mean, it's it's all meant to be whimsical and humorous, and it would have been perceived that way for sure. Okay, so that's the whole meaning. Uh, this is balanced. Each panel is symmetrical. Look at that. There are two figures. Right. And then in this one, there's three and this guy's you know, obviously in the middle. So roughly balanced each each panel. Uh, and then we have the rhythm, of course, of the heads, arms, legs. Right. And, and some of the well, the beards here uh, and the instruments here, the goblets, the wine goblets. There's a lot of rhythm. Uh, most of the figures are stable. The, each panel, there is obviously dynamic detail to the curves of their backs. And, uh, you know, obviously the, the heads of these three figures are round, um, but they're upright and the objects they're carrying or playing right here, the, the, the harp, at least that part of it, and the, this whole set of objects and, you know, the goblets and the um, wine jugs, and it's mostly stable with some dynamic details. Then everything is done with bold, almost all the lines are bold. Uh, you can especially see it here. But there is some thin line mixed in, you know, like around the faces. The outer lines around each each uh, object and each figure are are bold, but uh, many of the details are, are done with thin lines. So it's both bold and thin. There is no color here. This is neutral. These are off white. If you want to know what the material is, you don't have to write this to remember it. But the inlay of each figure that you see in each panel is done with mother of pearl, which is kind of a whitish gray color. And that would qualify as neutral. And the background is painted black lacquer. You know, wood, I'm sorry, I meant wood. Lacquer is, that's what lacquer is. If you, if you've ever been to Eastern Europe, and like, you know, I have been to Russia because they told you we adopted our daughter from there. But I've been other parts of the world that today still make those things. Lacquer boxes, lacquer icons, lacquer, you know, souvenirs. It's painted wood. So that's black paint over wood. And this is inlaid uh, off white. You can say mother of pearl, or you could just say stonework. Uh, it's, it's, it's actually an odd combination of things. But the point is that the colors are not warm or cool. It's totally neutral. And then there is the um, technique for space. There's only one overlapping. If you think this looks like register lines, think again. So I would make sure you write that clearly. If it's on the essay part of the exam, you get points off because these are separate scenes in different rooms of the palace. This guy isn't further away from us than this. They're not even in the same scene. These are separate panels of separate scenes in separate rooms, not the use of register line. You'll see that when we get to Egyptian art next week, but not here. So only overlapping is used, of course. The largest mass, well, you be the judge. Here it's a scorpion guy. Here it's the bear. I guess it's probably the lion here. And then here it's pretty close, whether it's the two uh, bulls or, or the uh, hero and the superhuman guy in the middle. And um, there's no modeling, but there is good semi texture. Look at it, done with, of course, carved lines. So there's also carved lines as well as outlines. And those create the textures of hair, of beards, right, of fur and so forth. Okay, let's see, what time is it now? Yeah, let's take our break, okay, everybody? We're going to pause the recording and let's make it 15 minutes. So at 8.22, we should still end a little bit early, but we do have a couple of really important slides 
uh, I think you'll find quite interesting. Um, and we may cut one of them. We probably will cut one of them. But I, you definitely want to be here for um, the ones of killing lions because they're very controversial uh, by today's standards. And one of those could be on the exam. So, okay, I'll see you guys in 15 minutes. All right. You said be back by 23, right? Yeah, okay, now it's 23. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. All right, thank you. Yeah. Okay, where we left off, and I'll admit this. Yeah, there we go. Okay, um, now I'm going to cut at least one of the remaining slides. There's a, uh, a sharper image of what we just saw. Okay. All right. Sorry, another person wants to come in. Welcome. Um, but let's move on to the next must know. Um, I have to decide which one to cut. I try to make it the least important one. Um, actually, I think on this one, I will uh, include it as one of the ones you need to take notes on. So it's your next must know. And th this won't take too long, though, because it's pretty straightforward. It's the title is Head of a Ruler from Nineveh. Now, these were all cities in ancient Babylon. That's N-I-N-E-V-E-H, Nineveh. Iraq, again, the same location uh, as far as the country today. And the date 2300 or 2300 BC. Okay, what we know about this person is that he was a local ruler. You know, you could say regional or district ruler. Uh, another way is to compare it to a, like a governor today. And uh, so he was, you know, you can just say governor of a province within the Babylonian Empire. In the early Babylonian Empire, you see it had several periods. The, the Babylonian Empire lasted for a couple thousand years or nearly. And it rose and fell like many other cultures at different points during those, you know, many centuries. This is the earliest period when they were just, you know, getting in together as a unified empire with a central, you know, capital, um, uh, which of course would have been um, much like Baghdad is today, right? It would have been Babylon, the city of Babylon. And then the other cities, this is one of the other cities, were regional capitals, like state capitals today. So he was a local or regional ruler, like a governor. And we don't know anything about him in detail, as far as maybe some historians think they know his name, but it's, it's not identified. Uh, it's Now, this qualifies, some people say, as a bust. But if you look carefully down here, I think you can see that's not part of the original design. It's a bronze head. It's hollow, and it's mounted on a cement stand. That's what this is in the museum that was placed there by the museum. Are we supposed to be able to see it? Yes. Uh, I, I, I can't see it. I can't. You are screen sharing, it says. Uh-oh. I see it. Yeah, I see oh, it too. I'm sorry. That's, that's nice. the front view. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> sorry. Yeah, because as long as it says screen sharing, everyone who's uh, hooked in or logged in uh, and has that function should be able to see it. Okay, moving on. Is there a specific reason why they're all just heads and not full busts? Like, were they resting ah, on something else or are they able to stand <laughs> by themselves? Uh, they. Th that's a good question too. You, it's a two-parter, right? All I can tell you is is a logical, uh, um, you know, educated guess. Here we go, um, which is that these were meant to be displayed and probably in a similar fashion to the way this one is now in a museum, in the palace or whatever the you know the the royal whatever court of each of these rulers. They're, they're, they would have had this on display at some point when they died, of course, then that would have been, you know, a part of their funeral uh, ritual or ceremony. And it would have been kept after they died as, you know, memorial to their ruling or their, their years as a ruler or their memory, if you want to say it. So, so yeah, I get, busts were just a common, all the ancient cultures, the Egyptians, uh, you've all heard of the bust of Nefertiti. If you haven't, you're going to see it next week and I got to see it. It's not in Egypt, I'll explain how that happened too. Uh, but it's magical, it's just an amazing thing to see it in real life. So it just happens to be, I guess, a common um, technique for portraying the quality of a leader or the characteristics of a, a person, an important person. Um, when they didn't, either that person didn't ask for a full sculpture of a full figure of themselves or the artist chose not to. Of course, plenty of sculpture was full 
full body, but these were, yeah, this, this, as far as we know. Now, some historians think it was attached to shoulders, so it could have then stood like a bus does today on a shelf. It could have, because this does look a bit kind of a jagged edge, like someone cut into it. It's possible that it was, you know, reduced to just the head and he originally might have had the shoulders, but we don't know that. Okay. Why is that on here? There we go. Something popped into my screen. It's gone now. Okay, let's talk about the only other part of the meaning is I think we have a, a view of the front, but this is a view if, if it's on the exam, I'm not saying it will. It's not one that I guarantee I won't cut. Uh, it's, you know, up in the air yet, but take the notes and hang on to them until we do the review. But in any case, assuming it might be on the exam, what I think you should focus on, the only other part of the meaning, uh, you know, before we do a quick formal analysis and move on, is uh, his expression. Look at his face. The beard, first of all, is a symbol. I don't think I've said this. It's very important. You're going to see it throughout the rest of this first half of this class. The longer the beard, the wiser and more important the man. In ancient art, in the ancient Middle East, right, or Near East, all the way through the Greeks. The Romans, no, they like the clean shave, as one historian put it. Very few of their rulers, some of them, but most of them didn't have beards, the emperors. But before the Romans, every other ancient culture, and you're going to see this as we go along, throughout the Mediterranean, just say the Mediterranean, because it that isn't just the Middle East. You know, like the Greeks, that's not the Middle East. Some people think Greece is part of the Middle East. No, 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 it's part of Europe. Uh, but they had that. So just say almost every ancient culture or up until or before the Romans, all the ancient cultures believed that longer a beard a person had or was depicted with, like here, the more important and wiser they were. So he's got a long beard, so he's supposed to be a wise, important ruler. Another clue as to what kind of personality we're talking about, his personality, the character or personality of this image, is his headdress. That is a finely hand-tooled leather headdress. There's no other way to describe it. Look at it. It goes, you know, into all kinds of detail here. The uh, sculpture, I mean, does the sculpture. So this is a leader's headdress. We don't have to guess that he was not a ruler or might. We know he was a ruler because- Those kind of look rulers. like braids in a bun to me. Is it okay. possible that that didn't, could be didn't, his hair? Didn't, didn't, didn't quite finish. <laughs> uh, good question, but it's two different things. This is the headdress and the hair is tied up in a bun underneath it. Yes, it's both. So you're right, that's a good point. Uh, yeah, that headdress and hairdo together is common for rulers, but the headdress by itself, you're gonna see proof of that in the next slide. So uh, is by itself proof that the person was an important ruler, sometimes the actual emperor. Uh, and they often, the Babylonians rulers, not every other ancient culture, but the Babylonians liked their rulers, uh, and honestly liked, but their rulers often liked to wear their hair up in a bun. Uh, but it is actually a headdress. There's no question that we actually have found them. I mean, there's not, leather isn't surviving for, the, well, actually could, it could survive in very tattered condition. But there are so many images of, you know, shops making these, headdresses for the ruling class. And of course, that didn't only mean the emperor or the king, it, it could be all the way down to, you know, like a mayor or a police chief or what have you, you know, important figures. So it's a, a, a ruler, we just, for short purposes, call it a ruler's headdress. And you could say hairstyle, if you want to add that, because it, that is true. It's a, it's a bun in the back. But the final clue, and we'll wrap up the meaning with this, is Look at the expression of his eyes, the pose of his, the tilt of his head and his mouth. What quality does anybody see here? There's no right or wrong here. What, what does this kind of uh, character, does this image of this particular man convey? With that um, confidence? Yeah, that's one. There's actually more than one thing. So what, what was that? Say it again. Kind. Yes. Benign, or as my aunt in Indiana used to say, Begnin, B E G N I, right? Benign or enlightened despot. Yes, he was a, I mean, they didn't vote on anything back then, and there was no electoral college. Right? Anyway, the point, the point is that he had actual power. He could do whatever he wanted. He could be a cruel despot, or in this case, yes, excellent, um, that, that last person. Um, 
there's no question this this is a deliberate attempt by the uh, artist to portray a, a ruler with some yeah you can say kindness uh, but uh, more commonly uh, the phrase is, is usually used is, is benign ruler or despot if you want because he was a despot I mean he didn't ask permission he did what he made decisions based on you know what the emperor might have told him and or whatever he wanted but he didn't seem cruel or arrogant we see plenty of that kind of ruler don't we all the way through history uh but this guy probably was not arrogant and not cruel you know uh doesn't mean he never ordered anyone to be executed if they broke the law we we can't know that but the point is he appears to be based on his expression and the tilt or you know the set of his head if you want to look he looks like he's looking down and listening to somebody and cares about what they're telling him who came to him for a decision you know a peasant or a, a carpenter or you know someone who is wronged and wants justice whatever one of his subjects we'd say he's probably listening in, in, in the throne room right in the palace to to a subject uh, asking for some help of some kind and uh, it it indicates that he he probably cares enough to want to be a just and kind ruler. Yeah, that's it on the meaning. Formal analysis. It is a single mass. It is a warm bronze, you know, brownish. The bronze can be several colors, but this is a warm uh, uh, brownish color of bronze. Uh, and then we have, oh, the cement texture. Superb on that leather headdress and on the... Um, um, you see his hair is underneath this is what's going on here if you the, the, and then the hair sticks out from the back through through the back of the headdress i didn't say that before when you, you somebody asked about that so it's it's a combination but mostly it's the headdress we're looking at and then we have the lines of course carved lines were used to create the similar texture on the beard the face the headdress right uh, it is um, stable, mostly, except for the details. I know you might say, well, there's a lot of curved lines, but he is upright. His beard, look, it's almost a straight vertical right, uh, right ang or angle, I mean, a uh, line, rather, line. Uh, and he's standing or sitting, we don't know which, this head anyway is being held straight upright. However, the face, obviously, all the details on the headdress and the face are dynamic. So it's both. It's balanced, or it was when it was new. I think I have an image of it from the side. Whoops, sorry, I didn't mean to do that. I mean, from the front. Yeah, there, look, someone damaged it to try and get those precious. You see the headdress there now? You see that? Yeah, right. Um, and so what you have is, um, you know, originally a completely balanced symmetrical image of a human head. Do it's, they know what was in the eye sockets? Uh, um, yeah, we do, because some were found with their uh, eye pieces <laughs> intact. Um, precious or semi-precious stones or metal, uh, usually metal, you know, like like uh, bronze or even sometimes gold. Right? You'll see that when we get to like full eyes? Greek sculpture. Pardon? Did they were they made to look like realistic eyes or were yes. they just like blank? Yes, yes they eyes. were. Oh yeah, they were with you know the whites and the pupil in the middle and two different colors of of stone or of metal. Yeah. They were either stone or metal. And usually if they were uh, stone, they were precious or semi-precious stone. And the same usually with the metal. Because these people were high ranking, they got you know the best materials. You'll see that when we get to the Greek sculptures, you'll see some of it. It's pretty impressive when they find them with the eyes intact. But most of the time they've been robbed thousands of years ago. Was it supposed to be symbolic that the eyes used the most precious metal? Or the yeah, I stone. think so. That's a good, good point. I'm not sure, but I, I really do believe that makes a lot of sense. Well, it would in that general way I mentioned just a moment ago, that the more valuable and uh, precious the stone, the more important the the uh, port, the person whose portrait was being made, or vice versa. The more important the person, the more valuable the eye. Oh, not just to the person, but like the eye itself, like the window to the soul is... Is that there a reason would, they put it in the socket? That's a reasonable assumption and it makes sense. And I, I think I would probably tend to agree, but I haven't seen any written uh, research on that. There probably is though. So maybe, I, I'm not sure to be honest. Okay, and then we have, uh, let's see, no modeling. It's a lighting from the museum. Already said there's carve line and the, the rhythm is obvious with the repeated pleats in his beard and the, the hand tool leather headdress, the face. Um, and I already said it's a single mass and it's, it, it was balanced when it was new. Okay, so now we're moving on to 
this really important piece. Now, this is my own slide. And if it was the only slide I had, I couldn't ask you to take notes because you can't see it. I want you to see the setting. This is the last of tonight's really, really important slides. I'm not cutting it from setting list. It's one of the world's most valuable artifacts. And it's in the Louvre. Uh, this is standing in the Louvre in Paris. I took this um, photo, this slide of it. It's The title is Steely, that's how it's pronounced, S-T-E-L-A, of Hammurabi. I have to spell his name for you, of course. Hammurabi. H-A-M-M-U-R-A-B-I. H-A-M-M-U-R-A-B-I. Don't put two Bs in his name or you'll turn him into a rabbi. He wasn't Jewish. Okay, uh, so again, it's the Steely or Stila is how they, some people pronounce, but it's pro most often pronounced Stili of Hammurabi. The location is Iraq yet again, and the date is 1750 BC. This is really important because it is the oldest law book or law um, document. You could just call it document. It's in stone, but yes, documents were often in stone back then yet found in the Western world. And the word steely is our last definition for tonight. Here we go. It's not a long one. It's a large piece of stone. And let's go see the actual close-up of it. Whoops, wait a minute. Oh, I know what happened. There it is, there it is. That didn't get put in the right order, but I think that's as good. Yeah, that's the more accurate view. That's the actual color. It's, it's a bluish black color. So steely, okay, it's at the top of page two of your list of terms to know, is a large piece of stone carved with scenes from an important event. I'm sorry, it's not short. Carved with scenes of an important event from that culture's history, comma, and often with writing below it, period. I'll say it again. Steely is a large piece of stone carved with a, a scene of an important important event from that culture's history, comma, and often with writing below it. Well, that's what this is exactly. That's why we call this the oldest law book yet found in Western art or art history. Uh, how could it be a law book? Well, it is because these here, let's get up close, are the laws written in their alphabet of the ancient Babylonians. There's a name for it, but you don't need to know that. Uh, they had one of the oldest written languages on earth. There are historians who debate this, and to this day, there's no a consensus. I go with the Egyptians, I'll mention why next week, as having the oldest written language in Western history uh, of any Western culture. Um, but it, it's not definite yet. So just say it's one of the two, ba ancient Babylonian, the alphabet used by, I'm sorry, the ancient Babylonians was one of the two oldest written languages uh, in, in Western history. And this is an example. These are the laws that the emperor and his name was, you can guess it, Hammurabi. He's one of these two, and I'll see if you can guess which one in a minute. But just to clarify the context, there's the first part about the meaning. We call this the oldest law book known, you could say, in Western history or Western art. Uh, because it has all the laws of that kingdom, the Babylonian kingdom or empire, uh, written, carved, if you prefer, down below the scene above, and the punishments for breaking each of those laws. So that's what a law book is, of course. It stipulates what you, know, you can't do or what, what is a law not to be broken. And if it's broken, it mentions at least some idea of what a punishment would be. Obviously, the actual final punishment is left up to the ruler that, that you know, um, you know, or the judge, if there is a judge, that interprets it. But this is an early, early law book, nearly 4,000 years old. So let's see if you can guess on the main part of the meaning besides that fact is what's going on in this scene. Can anyone here, there's again, you know, it's not absolute right or wrong. Uh, well, we do know who is who in this scene, uh, but, but, but just taking an educated guess, looking at this scene. Can anybody guess which one of these two is the ruler and which one is the God giving the ruler the laws? You probably can tell by their poses. The God is on the right sitting down. Yes. There's no way a ruler would sit in front of a God. Exactly. Everybody hear that? That's exactly said perfectly. Yeah, I'll say it again. 
that in any image of uh, art, certainly in the ancient world, where there's both a ruler and a god, the god is always the one that's seated and the ruler is the one standing. As you just said, you would never see a god stand. The god is more important if, you know, there's both in the same image in here where that means this is Hammurabi. That was Do the, we know what God is being shown? Yes, they, they had a name for him. I can't uh, uh, pronounce it. it the Lawgiver God is the translation in English. Now, did anybody see The Exorcist? I'm sorry. We just uh, there's a quick. How is it? There is such a God as the one that was in that movie, the original Exorcist with Linda Blair. But if you've never seen it, it's it's the, still pretty impressive the, for how far back. It scared the daylights out of everybody. When the name first. of the God is Marduk. Yeah. Oh, thank you. I did, yeah, I've seen it. How do you spell that? M-A-R-D-U-K. Marduk. Interesting. Okay. Yeah, Pazuzu was the actual evil god that they portrayed in The Exorcist. I mean, there is images of him. I used ah, to have slides of Pazuzu. What the fuck do you want? <laughs> yeah, makes your head spin when you think it, about it. She just walks away. Oh, fuck you, pumpkin. Hey, Michael, your speaker's on. Oh, yeah, oh, thank you crap. for pointing that out. Thank you for, okay, you don't need to know the name of him. You could just call him the uh, lawgiver god, or you can use the name if you want, M-A-R-D-U-K, right? Thank you for that. So he's the god, and there's several clues. If it wasn't enough that he's the seated one and the emperor is standing in front of him, being told what laws, these down here, he should enforce. So this is up on a mountain. You, you know, this should sound familiar. Let's see. Who was it that escaped from the Egyptians and walked through the Red Sea and then went to Israel? Yeah, obviously, Moses, the same story. It is. Moses got a, supposedly a, an audience with God and the Ten Commandments. But it's the same story. Almost all these ancient religions have, you know, and modern religions, of course, have their roots in ancient religions, obviously. They almost all have these origin stories that are so similar. It's just amazing why people kill each other over differences in religion. It's so dumb. Anyway, you know, Moses is the same concept done, you know, several hundred years later, um, as told to the ancient Hebrews. So here we have the lawgiver God. You can just keep it simple, call him that. Uh, and he is dictating, yes, dictating the laws that... Hammurabi will now go back down onto earth. He's on a mountaintop somewhere where the lawgiver God lives up in the you know, high mountains or something. He's going to go down, uh, back down to his palace and have this set of laws carved out right there is where they are, of course, and keep them in his palace and then make copies. Yes, he did. It's part of, we know this. Copies were made and sent to the local rulers, like that guy we just saw, the governors, if you want to call them, in each province, so that they had the same laws and the same text, even if it's in stone, it is a text uh, or law book that they could refer to when they were passing judgment on, on people who broke the law. And the other clues that wrap the, the meaning up here is that this is the God. Look at his beard and compare it to Hammurabi's. It's much longer. His beard goes almost to his waist. He's the more powerful and the wiser. He does not have this hand tool leather. This one's a simpler one, but that is a ruler's headdress. And if you look closely, there's a small bun just barely visible in the back. Similar to, but not the exact style, because uh, this is a little bit uh, later. This is about 600 years later than the ruler we just saw. But it's a similar kind of uh, hard, you could just say hard or tooled leather headdress. So he's got the ruler's headdress for you know a, a, a ruler uh, on earth. But this guy has a divine headdress. That's what they were called. It's the spiral pattern and there's no you know description of it that i've ever read as to what material if any it's just symbolic of the power of a god of, of a supernatural being so that's a, a divine headdress and then we have the fact that this is a staff and that's part of the there are two more facts about the meaning then we'll do a formal analysis that is you know a symbol of the authority of a ruler and it's being handed to Hammurabi by the lawgiver God. The one with the greater authority conveys his powers or some of his authority on the human ruler. You see that. So it's a symbolic transferring of the power to enforce the laws from the God, the lawgiver God, to the emperor, to the uh, king or emperor Hammurabi. And if that's not enough, we have an example of wardrobe failure. Oops, no, that was from the halftime show with Jenna <laughs> You see here off his shoulders, it does look like something's coming loose from his, uh, you know, ropes, but it's supposed to be divine energy. And I'll show you a close up. 
emanating from the body of all gods in Babylonian art, at least the more important, most important gods, would be, uh, you know, divine light or energy in this case coming out of his shoulders. All of those are enough to any one, I'm sorry, any one of those and all taken together is overwhelming evidence that, that this guy on the throne is the god and the other one standing is the emperor. Okay, that's pretty much the whole meaning. Although if you're curious about this piece of stone, you don't have to write this, but you could if you want to as part of the meaning and I would we'll do a quick analysis of th this is diorite. It's one of the hardest stones. No, that's why it survived and it was buried in sand in I think it's what's now Syria. And why is it in the Louvre? Because Napoleon's soldiers, well, not his soldiers actually, but his army, somebody, he had our colleague, uh, archeologist with him. You know, he spent three years in the Middle East. I don't know if you didn't know that. Uh, Napoleon's army invaded Egypt and then worked their way very slowly and unfortunately slaughtering as they went through the local cultures all the way, you know, partway down the Nile and then into what was not Egypt then it was, I mean, Israel, sorry, but what's now Israel and Jordan and up the coast through what's Lebanon and Syria. And then he, he, um, he, he went back to France. So he had taken many artifacts out of the Middle East and had them moved to the Louvre. He's the one that made the Louvre Museum. So you can summarize it if you want to write that in one sentence at the end of the notes on the meaning. This piece was found by Fr the French army during Napoleon's invasion of the Middle East and taken back to France where it's on display today in the Louvre. That's how it got there. All right, formal analysis. The largest mass is clearly the god. If he stood up, he'd be, you know, a giant here. Then the emperor, Hammurabi, and then the throne. Uh, and then we have only overlapping, obviously, is the only technique for space. The Sumerian textures are pretty good on the beard, on the headdresses, on the robes, and even the throne. It looks kind of Art Deco, the 1930s furniture there, which is, of course, inspired by ancient near eastern art and <clears throat> so that it has a kind of a, a simulated texture and all of the simulated textures of course are done with carved lines and there is no modeling as a technique but it's a bas relief i actually didn't say that but it should be obvious but i should have said that part of the meaning is this is a bas relief and i already defined that term for you uh, and the only way you could see these figures is because of the light. In this case, the museum light creates the modeling, but it's not in the composition. It's the effect of it, of course. Uh, and then we have balance. I think it's roughly balanced because this guy seated, his headdress and the emperors are about the same height. Uh, but you could make the case that when you add the throne in and the width of his uh, uh, robes here, right? of the god, they seem slightly wider maybe than the robes of Hammurabi. So if you see it that way, you could say that it is weighted somewhat towards the right. But I see top to bottom, it is roughly equal if you draw the line here. Uh, there's the obvious rhythm of the hands, the headdresses, the folds and their robes and, and uh, the patterns in their beards. And this is a black stone by definition, not warm or cool. It looks blue here, but it isn't. It's a bluish white back up again one more time to show you. Whoops, there it is. See, it's black with a bluish overcast because of the lighting. So that's neutral. Okay, I think that's, um, yeah, that's pretty much all of, oh, stable or dynamic? It's almost entirely stable. Look carefully, things are almost all at a right angle. The way he's seated, uh, the way he's standing, only uh, one of each of their arms have a diagonal and the tops of their headdress. So it's mostly stable. All right, the next one we're going to see is uh, Asher Nazar Paul killing lions. This should cause some controversy for some of you, and it does for me as an animal lover. Uh, but it was a, not an uncommon scene in the ancient world. Okay, Asher Nazar Paul killing lions. I need to spell his rather sorry long name for you. A S S U R N. A-S-I-R-P-A-L. A-S-S-U-R-N-A-S-I-R-P-A-L. Asher Nazarpal, that's how it's pronounced. Killing lions. The date, uh, sorry, location is Iraq and the date is 850 BC. Now this is a departure from the location wise, is a departure from, even though it says Iraq, because today it would be 
where it was found and we believe carved. It's a barley petal that was in a royal palace of a, a king named Ashurnasipal. But this is where it differs from all the Babylonian works. He wasn't Babylonian. It's important detail. He was Assyrian with a capital A, like the modern country Syria, but only A-S-S, -S, right? Y-R-I-A-N, of course. He was Assyrian. Who were the Assyrians? They were the most warlike and aggressive of all the ancient Middle Eastern cultures. They conquered almost the entire uh, Middle East and ruled brutally over all their conquered people. And they were hated and overthrown within a short time, like 150 years. It may seem like a long time to us today, but in the ancient world, that's not a long time. So, you know, in less than two centuries, I don't know, it depends on how you start, you know, counting them as, you know, when they began conquering their neighbors to the point where they um, made an empire out of, they conquered the Babylonians. The Babylonians were under their rule, as were the Israelis, the, the, you know, the Hebrews, and uh, many other cultures in that area, what we today call the Middle East. So just say they conquered a large part of the Middle East. They didn't conquer the Egyptians, but they fought with them and they were very aggressive. So once again, who are the Syrians? They were the most warlike and aggressive of all the ancient Middle Eastern cultures, which is saying a lot because they were all somewhat like that, but they were even more aggressive and they conquered most, you could just say most of what is now the Middle East. Many of the other cultures, including the Babylonians, were under their rule. So here he is, the head of a, a major empire during the high point of that, when they had this power over everyone. And what's he doing? Well, this is a major part of the meaning here. He is supposedly hunting lions. Now, I like that Stockstead, in this case, I totally agree with what she did. She, most uh, uh, history texts I've seen uh, have listed this as Asher Nazarpal hunting lions. Like he's a great hunter, he's a great sportsman, he's a brave man risking harm out in the wild. No, nothing like that. So this is what you should be focused on here. This is meant as a piece of political propaganda. There's your alliteration for tonight. This piece was carved to, uh, you know, let's just say stroke the ego, if you want to put it that way, or to, um, you know, make the emperor... Asher Nazarbal, of course, uh, seem like a brave, right, uh, hunter when the truth is the opposite. So how could that be? There was no hunting involved and there was no contest here. There was no risk involved to the emperor. Here's why. His soldiers would go out into, you know, the countryside, you know, the desert in essence, or well, the edge of the jungle. You know, lions don't live in jungles, they live in savannas, but whatever, just say out into the wilderness. Excuse me, I need to take a drink here. It's water, all right. Anyway, they would uh, go out regularly. He would send his soldiers out, not all of them, but you know, groups of them, into the wilderness to capture lions and bring them back to a compound near the royal palace where they were denied water and food for day after day after day until they were so weak that they were not seriously until they were threatened with a final assault by the king with death, then they might rise up briefly. It's called the death agony. These animals are suffering that kind of fate. And if that's not enough, that they were starved and, and de denied water long enough to, you know, be really weak and not quite defenseless, but nearly so, if that's not enough of a stacked deck for you, often the hind legs tendons were severed as has been done here to this one. Let me see if I can get that over here. And if that's not enough to stack the deck against the poor lions, the soldiers had poison-tipped spears and swords that they could use to, uh, you know, obviously, therefore, cripple the lion further. It, there was no, in other words, the bottom line is this was not even close to an actual sporting event or a contest or any kind of a risk to the king. It was Is it a, known how the lions were captured in the first place? Yes. Oh, it's well recorded. Yeah. They're, Did they oh, use like booby traps or what? Oh, oh, 
I thought you that they, I thought you said that they were captured by the soldiers. We know that. I'm not sure how, but who knows? It's, you, know, you don't, of course, need to know that for the exam. But I, I will say that probably, yes, they probably used booby traps, you know, the way often are in parts of Africa now. Although lion, many lion sections of Africa are protecting their lions, but of course there are poachers, they always have. But yeah, probably, probably booby, booby traps and uh, other kinds of. But in any case, when they capture them, they would capture them in, you know, fairly, you know, intact, if you want to call it that, or, you know, let's say uninjured, except maybe if they didn't do a good job of, <laughs> of setting up those booby traps, they might have injured. But they tried to capture them uninjured, so they looked like these lions do, and they looked like they were capable of, you know, great damage or, you know, fighting you know, valiantly against their human, well, what's the word? I call it animal abuse. I don't know about the rest of you, but I don't see any other word for that. So this, why was this panel um, created? As I said, so if you didn't write it now, you should. It was created by an artist at the order of the um, emperor, you know, or king, two words are almost interchangeable, of the Assyrian Empire, Asher Nazapol. There he is in the chariot to make him look like he's a brave, fearless hunter, risking his life to prove how strong and brave he is. When it obviously now that you know the facts, it's just the opposite of the truth. I find it um, reprehensible, but in the ancient world, uh, nobody questioned, well, not nobody, some people did question it. I'll prove that to you with the next slide. But in this kingdom, at this time, this empire, the Assyrians, Nobody would have questioned that. And when he went to the Royal Palace, they walked by a bunch of different panels of him hunting in different scenes at different times. And they all made it, tried to make him, all these Bowerly panels were supposed to make, they were intended to make him look brave and fearless. Well, that is not the case. In fact, this might help you remember how to spell his name, but of course you can look it up because you have open notes and his open book exams, obviously in this class uh, because of this uh, Zoom format. but. Anyway, in case you just want to remember, I, I always liked it. When I saw this slide back in college, I remember thinking all these things when the professor told us this stuff. Uh, is the name, see how it's spelled? A -S 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 -U -R -N. I think of it as the first three letters of his name say what he was. Okay. Uh, you know, but he wasn't the only one that did this. Most rulers would, would have that kind of uh, rigged, right? Talk about rigged <laughs> game or setup that was totally unequal and unfair to the animals. Just because, of course, if they didn't, they might actually have ended up getting mauled or even killed by one of their prey, or I'd call them victims. The animals were victims. Okay, so there's Asher Nazarpal, and here now we're going to do the formal analysis. Are some of the the most I would call them um, unskilled or naive is the word we usually use today. Naive details of this work of art. We'll start with space. Well, obviously the only technique here is overlapping, but when you get to these horses, I have to say my daughter, when she was in kindergarten, could draw a group of three horses side by side better than this. Spaghetti legs, she would have called these a lot of her drawings when she came home. Of course, she, she would do the same thing. You see what this is? It's supposed to be three horses side by side. It's just totally unrealistic, of course. So the skill here is in the Simulate texture, and that's well done on the lion's fur, right? Uh, and his beard and uh, his, you know, uh, clothing and uh, the chariot. There's really good simulate texture, and that's all done with carved line, of course. Um, and then we have, it's a bas-relief panel, remember, that automatically means that modeling is a strong part of the, of the effect. So it is an actual technique because, of course, these were carved with that in mind. Now, in the palace, it would have been torchlight. What else would it be? Or daylight, depending on what room and what time of day you saw them. Uh, but here in the museum, it's in the British Museum, by the way, in London. I've seen this panel up close. And it's not quite life size. It's about, actually, it's more like half, or a little bigger than half life size. So for, for space, you just have overlapping of three horses looking like, you know, <laughs> Uh, childlike drawings, but in any case, that's overlapping, obviously, as is, you know, the chariot overlapping him and his uh, arms overlapping the bow, and of course, the soldiers overlapping their shields, lots of overlapping, it's the only technique for space. Now, the largest mass is harder. If you take these three horses as a single mass, it's probably them. 
But there are those who think this lion who looks slightly bigger than this one would be the largest mass or at least the second. So maybe it's those three horses, if you take them as a group, the largest mass, then the nearly dead or dying lion and then the roaring lion would be the third largest. Um, and then we have the rhythm, of course, of the um, ar arms, legs, uh, both the humans and the animals and the weapons, you know, the shields and the swords, uh, the horses, lots of rhythm. And is it stable or dynamic? I think of it as almost more stable than dynamic because he's standing upright. The chariot is upright. Uh, this lion is practically horizontal and these soldiers are upright, but then you do have the dynamic detailing, of course, of the uh, arm and bow of the emperor and this lion and the horses. So it's both. Um, and then um, we have, uh, let's see, the color, oh yeah, well, sandstone and sand, of course, the color of sand is obviously an earth tone. So it's a warm color. Uh, and I think I said the semi texture is really good, didn't I, on the hair, right? and the chariot, yeah, it's superb. And that they were very, very talented, very skilled at. Uh, oh, is it balanced? Well, I think so, because if you draw the line down the middle and you put him in the middle or near the middle, uh, and then you take these soldiers and this lion and, and the dead lion, or nearly dead lion and the horses, it's roughly balanced left to right. Uh, but top to bottom, it is clearly weighted toward the bottom. Okay. Uh, this is important work. Uh, the next one, the two kind of are uh, complementary to each other, and I'll explain that in a minute. But anybody have any questions about this one before we move on? Okay, the next one shows a very different view of a similar scene. And this is one of the most famous bow relief panels from the ancient world. Uh, it's called just two words, dying lioness. For decades, it was called dying lion. It's like, huh? Can't you guys figure out that this is a female lion? It is definitely a lioness. So dying lioness, of course, with obviously two S's. Iraq, and the date is 650 BC or BCE. Okay, so this should be obviously different in one way. It's a close-up of a single lion that if it's not obvious has just been hunted and or i would just say you know abused to death or you know whatever uh you know uh, assaulted in a, a hunt like the last one the babylonians had now reconquered this is an important part of the meaning this is a piece from babylon again it's the latter part of the babylonian empire which would be you know the time from just before the ancient greeks cities or around the early Greek city-states uh, up until the Roman times. So the Babylonians last period is when this was made during their golden age, when they had the most powerful and largest empire, they had the three phases. So this is their final phase. And yes, they did the same thing as the Syrians when it came to hunting scenes with their emperor and their other ruling class uh, hunters, you know, the sons of the emperor and all the other whatever royal family members. Uh, male, of course, mostly would go out and do the same thing that I just described. So this this lion clearly has had its hind legs, tendons. I meant tendons severed. I mean, you know what? What is the remote thought of there being any kind of a contest when you do that to a, an animal before you start hunting it? And of course, it's on. It's. I hate to use a bad. I'm not trying to bad. On isn't my intention, but. It's on its last legs. The other way to say it, a better, more accurate way, is to say it's it's in its death agony, and the animal is roaring in obvious pain, psychological, or you could say emotional and physical pain. And these arrows were probably poisoned, poison tipped, and obviously that's the blood coming from the wounds. Uh, and it had already, almost certainly, because we know this is how it was done among the upper. This was done for another emperor, the Babylonian emperor. Uh, for another palace bow relief panel um, in what would have been probably um, Babylon, the actual capital, or one of the other larger cities in the Babylonian Empire. So people would have passed by and see it and think, oh, you know, there's part of a panel and there were other sections which are in different sections on display in the same part of the museum, the British Museum. And you don't have to know where it is, but it's in London. 
And if you put them together, you've got a complete scene. But this panel was separated, I don't know, by history, I mean, not by history, by, by, by the weather or time or maybe by the archaeologist. So it stands alone as a panel. But it was originally part of a larger scene. That's important detail. And what did that scene show? Well, again, an emperor hunting lions with a completely rigged setup here, where the lions had no chance. But you know what's different about this? I bet uh, most of you have noticed this. Look at the expression, the emphasis the artist made on the lion's agony, right? Death agony is the phrase. The physical and emotional suffering of this animal. Anybody guess why the artist could maybe have done that? Emphasize the detailing here to, to, to bring out more of the suffering of this animal? To make the viewers sympathize with it yes. and uh, plight. Yes, yes. I think there's no question. Historians can disagree, but most of the ones I've read, and when I stood there in front of it, I definitely could feel that. I, in other words, you could just say many historians always want to keep it simple because you can't prove you know, one way or the other you know, no, nobody wrote something down about why the artist did that. So just say many historians believe the artist of this panel was trying to make us or wanted us to identify with the suffering of this animal by emphasizing its pain. And if well, that's true, it's really unusual. In the ancient world, that could have gotten this artist executed because it's kind of pointing out the unfairness here, right? Isn't it? of this so-called hunt or ritual or, or you know, uh, abuse, however you want to call it. And therefore, if people looked at it that way, they might not think so highly of the person that done the hunting, that shot the arrows, the emperor. They might have thought less of him. And so I think the artist was taking a risk. That, that's just my own. I haven't read that anywhere. But plenty of historic uh, documents have written about this, been, I'm sorry, been written about this. And, and just say many historians agree that it probably is a rare, in a rare, not never heard, unheard of, but rare example in the ancient world of an artist empathizing with the suffering of an animal at the hands of humans. It just Do you think it's a silent protest that he was like trying yeah. to hide it in there? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think the emperor didn't get it, but I don't know if we know whether that emperor saw this and realized what the artist was intending and then had him tortured or executed, but we don't know. At least I've never read that anyone knows who the artist was. But the artist was taking a risk. Or well, if, if it is what we think it is, it's probably, yes, a, an act of some courage for the artist to do that. Was the rest of the, like, that it was part of, was it like glorifying everything else? Yes. It was just this one panel? Yeah, that's my memory. You know what? You could verify that if you have time. I, I'm so busy, I probably won't thing to do it by going on the British they might not have images of all the other panels they'll have one of this I'm sure in their website the British Museum in London um, but um, uh, I, I think so my memory I was here in 04 and I spent a whole day in that section because I'd studied it I was already teaching this class uh, for many years by then and I always felt strong connections to the two panels for different reasons they're in the same I think they're in the same room of the one we just saw of Asher Nesbol and this one. And this one, yeah, I, my memory just say, I, it's likely <laughs> that it is uh, the one section, a single section of a larger image, which is the only one that really did this much to emphasize the suffering of this victim, this animal. Um, but we don't know that for sure. Just say many historians believe this. And if so, the artist was taking a risk. That, if that's the case, there's no question that was a risk for the artist to do that. Um, you know, when you get to the 18th century and 19th century portraits of kings, if you take art 1.2, which I do teach and hope to teach again, or 2.3, I think it covers that. Goya, the great Spanish painter, oh, fantastic. His portraits of his own king and the king's family were very, he was a royal portrait painter. He was mocking them and they didn't get it, luckily for him, or he would have been thrown in prison, unfortunately, uh, because they were so. How would he mock, mock them? Uh, well, you'd have to see the portrait of uh, Charles, oh, I can't remember, it's Charles the Fourth, 1802, the only portrait where the whole family is lined up. And he, the artist, Goya himself, is a young man at that time. He lived well to his 80s, he's in the background, and you could just see the contempt in his face, but also the. Uh, he just portrayed them warts and all. I don't mean physically, but their character came through and they were a corrupt bunch of uh, people. That, that's why they lost the throne. And then Napoleon came in and took over Spain. 
thank you, I'll take that throne. You know, and gave it to his brother. But for a while, the Spanish got rid of their own king and rebelled. They were one of the first countries in Europe to rebel against, uh, successfully against their own king. Uh, I think it was 1802 or 1803. So if you look up Portrait of Charles, the I think it's fourth, could be the, <laughs> one of the first three or four. Uh, Charles the fourth, fifth or sixth. Yeah, um, 1802, Goya, you know how to spell his name, Goya. It's a remarkable work of art where that guy, Goya was taking a risk and he knew it, but he just was so repelled by their behavior and their actions against their own people that he decided to go ahead and betray them the way he really saw them. Okay, let's wrap this one up and then we'll do one more. Okay, but I'll be very quick with it. And we'll still end early because it's only 9.12. We'll end about 9.22 or so, okay? Um, formal analysis, a single mass, yes, unless you count the arrows and then you'd say the largest mass is of course the lioness and then the arrows. There's only overlapping for space, obviously, here. The arrows and the blood overlap. The, the lioness's body. I guess the ears overlap her head. Uh, here, the cinematic texture. This isn't the sharpest slide. It's just what they had available in the slide library. It's quite sharp. So it's done very realistic cinematic texture on the uh, body of the uh, lion, uh, her face, her paws, and on the arrows. And that's all done with carved line. And of course, it's it's not obvious, but it's also sandstone, which is the material again. Uh, literally the color of sand, so it is warm by definition. And the modeling, it's a Bobberly panel. So again, modeling is a major part of the composition. The effect of it is all around the you know strong modeling visible, in this case, from the museum lighting, of course, originally from sunlight. And uh, then it's balanced. If you draw a line down here, the lion's body is roughly on, you, you know, if, if you make this the middle part. And I would argue top to bottom, too, because depending on where you draw the line. Roughly balanced left to right and top to bottom. It is dynamic. There's not a straight line in it. Um, all of the angles are diagonal. Or then there's curves, of course, on, on the face. Um, and let's see. Um, rhythm, dynamic, balance. Am I forgetting anything? Texture, space, color. I think that's it on this. Okay. All right. Um, yeah. It seems like I'm forgetting something, but I can't think. Okay. All right, I have to go back now. Here, we're going to go back because of the way that this was put together. Uh oh, I'm giving you a preview of next week. I didn't mean to do that. <laughs> That's okay. You get some idea. It's really, I'm sure you'll find that. And my own slides of uh, Cairo are going to be shown too. Uh, not just Cairo, but. Uh, Okay, I guess she didn't include this. Oh no, did she not? Hang on, I'll keep going. I wanted to show you uh, Ishtar Gate from Babylon. It's pretty impressive. I'm getting kind of a quick overview of the whole semester. I think I have, they might be at the beginning. See, I didn't create the order here. Uh, the slide library did it for me and she was retiring. So she was in a hurry and I don't fault her. She wasn't you know, being paid overtime. She'd stayed late right before she left, or I wouldn't have this set of slides to show you. Okay, the, these are, the, okay, here we go, here we go. All right, it's at the beginning, but you can't, you know, jump to the beginning from the end on this kind of slide file. It's just the way they created it. Okay, so this is our last must know. Ishtar Gate from Babylon. Ishtar, I-S-H-T-A-R. This won't take very long. Gate from Babylon, and if I didn't spell it before, I probably didn't, and you haven't ever written it. It's B-A-B-Y-L-O-N. Location is Iraq, and the date is 575 BC. Babylon was, at the time this was built, this is a recreation of the gate. So let's start with that fact. What are we looking at? It's a museum exhibit in Berlin, Germany. I've stood there and looked at it. This is my own slide of it. I took this slide. It's not easy to get it because it's 50 feet tall to get the whole thing and there's a skylight up above. So just say this is a recreation or restoration. You see there are differences of opinion on this. Parts of it are authentic from 575 BC and those are the dark panels, the darker panels. You see that? Yeah. The bas relief sections, just say it that way, the bas relief sections of animals, they are all sacred animals to the Babylonian religion, to the ancient, you get to say ancient Babylonians. They are goats, 
right? Horses uh, and uh, jackals, those are the main animals. There are many other holy animals or sacred animals in the ancient Babylonian religion, but those are the three that they chose for the gate. This is the main entrance of the city of Babylon, which this is really important. In fact, the largest city in the ancient world up to that time. Rome was way bigger, but this was half a million people. Some say 600,000. Even now, that's not, that's like four times the size of Santa Rosa, right? So just say it was the largest city in the ancient uh, world up until that time, and by far the most powerful. It was the capital of the largest empire in the ancient Near East, not in the world, there were bigger empires, China had a bigger empire, but, but in the ancient Near East, the Babylonians second or last, I don't know if I'm saying second, it was probably third, just say their last empire was during the time they built this, this gate. And it was the main entrance what we're looking at is, is the dark blue parts are reproductions by the museum. So they found these, you can imagine, in rubble, and some of these were broken into shards and had to be restored. So these pieces here, where I'm circling with my uh, cursor, are, are mostly original, 2,000, almost 2,600-year-old pieces. But the rest of the gate was just, you know, disintegrated or, or such small pieces of it. They just decided to reconstruct the actual walls and incorporate the original bas-relief pieces. Everybody clear on that? And then this is, you, you know some of you from maybe various video games and movies and, and books. This is what you saw in medieval castles, but here it goes thousands of years ago. Battlements, these are called. And the battlements are where the soldiers always, 24 hours a day, they had soldiers stationed to guard the city. Because of course they had enemies. They ruled over all these conquered people who didn't want to have, including the Jews in Israel, right? And um, uh, Arab tribes around them, though they were Arabic, pre-Arabic themselves. And the Turks up north, they ruled part of what's now the southern part of Turkey. So just say they ruled almost the entire Middle East at this point in time. In fact, some of my Jewish friends, maybe a few of you would know this from your own culture if you're Jewish, the Babylonian captivity, it was called, is the period when Hanukkah, right? The tale of Hanukkah and all the tradition with it. It happened during this period when the Babylonians had occupied the kingdom of Israel and ruled it very brutally. And they were harsh rulers, I just say, but they were powerful. They were in their golden age at the height of their power. And then the final thing I'll say about this is that uh, the fact that this is in Germany and several pieces now tonight, we've talked about next week, we're gonna say more of this, is a course you could mention as the last fact about the meaning is it was taken away from what is today the country of Iraq, uh, which was then actually a kingdom conquered by the, the um, British, but somehow the German archeologists were able to get to this site first and bring it back to Berlin. It's in a museum of ancient Middle Eastern art, in Berlin, Germany. It's a very impressive museum. Every room has different scenes. By the way, this you don't need to write, but just to wrap up with a little bit of a, anybody watched the Hitchcock movie or even heard of it called Torn Curtain with Paul Newman and his wife actually, <laughs> and several other famous actors. It's, it's set in East Germany during the Cold War, during the communist era, of course, where the Berlin Wall was still up. And there's a chase scene where Paul Newman's character is being chased by one of the East German spies because they suspect him of being a, a spy, not a professor. He pretends to be a professor of art or of science, I'm sorry, science. And in one scene, they go to this museum and there's, they, they follow each other, two characters through, I think as I recall, through this actual archway here, through this gate. Anyway, it's a fascinating uh, site to have this 50 feet tall. So let's do the formal analysis and call it night. Uh, and then I'll stick around as long as anyone has questions. Last night it went over 20 minutes after the last slide. For anyone who has questions, that's my informal office hour. So, so hold your questions until then, unless they're about this slide. And then if you want to sign off, fine. If you have questions, just stick around until I answer them. Okay, so it's balanced. Well, yeah, it's totally symmetrical that you can't tell because I couldn't get both towers in this one photo. They, uh, for space, it's real space. These are 50 foot tall towers with a 40 foot tall archway in the middle. 
there's real space. There's no other taking. Oh, you could say the animals overlap the wall, but that's stretching it. They're just decorations. And then, of course, the rhythm is obvious with the geometric decorations, the battlements up at the top, and the various repeated animals, right? So lots of rhythm with, you know, more than two of each animal. And there is some texture on the animals, on their, you know, their hair. Uh, Are they just guessing where the animals were placed on the wall? Uh, that's a good question. Now, boy, you guys are asking a lot of good questions tonight that no one's ever asked before. I imagine they had some evidence because there are, well, Alexander the Great conquered the city, right? He's the one that finally took it over. And his historians wrote down the one thing you could say about, we'll get to him, of course, we get to the Greeks, um, about his empire is that it was a little more enlightened than, than many of the others, in which that when he conquered a new uh, kingdom or, or, or empire or culture or city, he would usually leave the local rulers, unless they were totally incompetent or extremely cruel, in place. And then he had his historians come and meet with him and write down in Greek and uh, also the local language their histories if they didn't already have that. And, and keep keep those as books about him. So we have some idea of what this gate looked like. Uh, I think they do know where they were. Yeah, maybe not the exact positioning, but the fact that they were arranged like this. Yeah, they had some evidence for that. Good question. Okay, so the color is, of course, a mixture of uh, cool blue and then a little bit of white on the arch. Uh, but of course, all the animals, well, not all, most of the horses are white, aren't they? So all the other animals besides the horses are warm earth tones or shades of brown and reddish brown, tan. Um, so it's a mixture. And of course, some of the geometric patterns are, are gold colored. The, you know, or you could just say yellow, but they meant to imply gold. Though that's not real gold, of course. Um, and then we have the um, balance was well, totally symmetrical, right? With the arch in the middle and the two towers of equal height. But again, for space, don't forget to write the real dimensions, 50 foot tall towers with a 45 foot tall archway in the middle. Uh, and then we have uh, dynamic uh, on the arch and I guess the animal's legs, but their bodies are upright. So it's a mixture, but definitely the arch, the opening where there was a giant wooden or metal gate that's long gone. They didn't recreate that here. You could just walk through this and stand there and look up at it. It's very impressive. So anyway, the point is that this is all um, dynamic in the archway, but the walls, most of this is stable, of course. Uh, the structure itself. Uh, and then can you break it down into different masses? I guess you could. The two towers are the largest mass, then the archway, and then the animals. Yeah, you could do it that way. Um, and then there is carved line on the animals that creates a simulated texture of their muscles and hair. Carved line. There is painted line on the decorations. And uh, then the uh, texture on the walls the blue, and that's brick, by the way, blue, brick, painted blue. Well, it's actually tile, it's, it's a kind of brick. So let's just say the blue tile on the walls is the real smooth texture of tile. There's no similar textures on the main parts of the walls, but the animals obviously do have. Uh, and then let's see, um, rhythm balance. I think that's, that's pretty much it. Okay. So any questions anyone has, you can you know, now sign off if you don't have any questions, but I'll stick around. Uh, as long as anyone has any kind of questions. Okay. Anybody? Thanks, Professor. I'm out of here. Yeah, thank you. Anybody have a question? Um, about, yeah. Uh, I do. First of all, I'm sorry about earlier. My dog was banging on my door and starting to get frustrated. Okay, She's been yeah. doing it all night. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, when, so I decided to look back on the email because I sent it because you, I can send the uh, mini bio in the form of te body text for the e through an email, correct? Yes. I did that. I guess it didn't go oh, through. I can send it again. And yes, please. If do I don't hear anything from you tomorrow night, I'll I can, confirm uh, it with I'll you by to tomorrow. Yeah. yeah, before dinner time. I, you know, no later than 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 five thirty or six. Yeah, I can do it right now. I'll, yeah, I, I, I like, check my in. email in the afternoon. So sometime between you know uh, three and six, probably close, earlier, you'll see a confirmation. A AOL, right? Mark W at AOL, please. Yeah. Yeah. Also, oh. And can, it's not, this one's not really a question, but can I point out, make an observation about Please. one of the uh, previous, uh, um, what's it called? Pictures, art. Slide. Um, for, uh, I'm not gonna even pronounce his name, uh, the guy killing lions. Um, Asher Nazarbal, yes. Yeah, 
I would like to point out that I think the propaganda, uh, I think that I'm pretty sure that artist was also mocking the, uh, you know, emperor at the time. Because if you look at the lion, the lion, it's all the lion, similar to the, the what was it? Dying lioness. The hunt, the lion was in fact, had, had a very painful expression. Now, most pieces have with animals being killed by a hunter in a glorious way, have the animal oh, uh, look well, beast, maybe. more bestial. I won't argue everything. with you about that at any, by any means, but I will say that there's a difference, that, that there's no one single creature that is focused on, you know, the story, you know, how when you try to tell a tragedy and you expand it to hundreds of thousands of people dying, or people don't respond as well as a single person's story. You know this from literature right. and human history. So that artist that did that single close-up of that dying lioness was clearly, I think, trying to do that. Whereas there isn't really any overt evidence that that was the intent of the other art. Could have been, but it just, to me, it's just so much like the others. I've seen all those panels. I walked all the way through that section of the museum and there are dozens and dozens of such hunting panels and they're pretty much all the same until you get to that one of the dying line. So that's why historians think it's an exception. Oh yeah. Another thing I want to point out too, is like there's also the opposite perspective, like the reason why that ant, why the lion looks at the, uh, in pain is to emphasize like, look at our great leader, he brought this mighty beast yeah, down. Yeah, that's to, the, yeah, yeah, that's more the classic uh, main line, mainstream interpretation that the emperor intended, yeah, good point. Okay, any other questions, uh, anybody about uh, grading or the pay, not grading, the requirements of the paper I've already answered, but if you still aren't clear on anything and you were listening earlier, of course, you can email me at any point. The papers aren't due for three weeks. Next okay. week, we are going to see ancient Egypt. I meant to tell everybody that. And we're going to see my own slides of the Great Pyramids uh, in, and to talk about what it's like to go inside the Great Pyramid, the largest, and inside King Tut's tomb. You'll actually see slides inside the tomb that I took, as well as along the Nile, what it looks like to take a boat trip along the Nile. So Actually, that's at the end of next week. Question, okay, any other questions? Yeah, I had a question about, sure. um, you said you had like the uh, previous lessons recorded, the previous Zoom meetings, and they were available. Did you say they were on YouTube or? YouTube, yes, under Mark Wilson's SRJC, you know, all capitals, Art History Lectures. And then just look up the individual lecture you want and you'll see the titles and the week, which week they are, which class. Uh, yes, now by 7 p.m. this lecture will be all, well, both of the two from this week. So every week at the end of that week by 7 p.m. on Friday, they're posted on YouTube, yeah. And they're yeah. open to the public, so you don't have to have a password. And I, I had one more question. Sure. Um, this, is my, this is my first one since I just added the class. Um, you talked about something about submitting a bio as like- Oh yeah, as, uh, you just need to tell, okay, if you haven't done that, you can, as long as you do it, hopefully by the end of the day tomorrow, uh, certainly no later than Friday, noon Friday, but as soon as you can. It's short. You just keep it to a, like a few sentences. Where have you lived and traveled before outside California or mm. the Bay Area? Is there okay. a, uh, Where you've lived and worked, it's real simple. Number two, just three things, is what is your work and education experiences? You know, have, what kind of jobs you've had and what you've studied. And last is your experience with art. You, you know, what interest you have or any skill you have relating to art, that's it. And that shouldn't take more than half a page. Is and email a, that to me as a PDF or in the body of a, an email itself, that'll be okay. Okay, um, is there like a, a prompt for this um, as like an assignment somewhere? Cause I was taking like Canvas. I don't know if you have anything up there on there. Yet, no, you but... send it to my AOL. Did, uh, okay, I'm not okay. using Canvas, yeah. I, got it, got it, got it. Yeah, yeah just, right. Just, yeah. Just, just make it clear. Yeah, just send it to me as a PDF though to Mark W at AOL. Okay, wait, so it was, um, where where have I lived and traveled? Yeah, you work in educational background, right? And third is your interest in art or your background in art. Okay, all right, and just get it to me okay. if you can tomorrow. You know. Yeah, of course. Thank you. Sure. Yeah, and and, and it's just my way of verifying that you uh, don't want to be dropped from the class. Yeah, and I know you don't. So you know, <laughs> just send it to AOL, and I'll confirm that I got it. Okay. Any other questions from anybody else? I think we got all the way to, what are we at? 9.30, so we <laughs> right about when we normally get. Of course, if you think of something between now and the next class, you, you can always email me. Uh, and then next week, I think you'll wanna be here for the whole class because ancient Egyptian art is very fascinating and important. At least one of those slides will be on the midterm. 
A and B, my own slides will be like the last 20 minutes where you don't need to take notes and just enjoy what it would be like to actually go to Egypt and see these real places as they exist today. Okay. All right. Thank you all. Take care. All right. Thank you. Bye. Good night. Bye. Thanks for your questions. See you next week. Okay.